Like for four years, I've done nothing else rather than, you know, waking up, studying, trading, studying, going to sleep. The fundamentals are the fuel. And then you check the price action to see if that fuel is used for the move, right? If that fuel has was put into action. If you study stock market history, you're going to see that breakouts uh, happen in clusters. I wanted to build my system to tolerate maximum pain. Say I have a 2 or 3% open risk. I'm not going to go into margin. Fine, you know, textbook setups. This is a textbook setup. Opinions do not matter. You just want to follow the clues and the price actions. The stocks that push up to 500% are usually also high, highly sorted stocks. I made a ton of mistakes. I lost many opportunities. I got frustrated a lot. It didn't matter. I still managed to make 290% for the year. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. Uh, this episode is brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. You can pick up your free copy down below. Uh, joining me today is someone who I've been really looking forward to talking to, uh, Marius Stamatoudis. Um, he is a top performer in this year's US Investing Championship with a stellar performance. Uh, Marius, really looking forward to getting into your process, your trading, how it's evolved over time. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. So Richard, uh, thank you so much for having me. I mean, it's, it's truly an honor to be here, uh, considering all the list of names that you you hosted in the past, right? And uh, yeah, I really thank you. I really thank you for considering me for your podcast. Yeah, of course. Uh, it, it's it's a pleasure to have you. And um, yeah, to start with, I always like to hear about people's background, and you've definitely got an interesting path uh, that I'm looking forward to diving into. So yeah, take me back to where you first got interested in the markets and kind of your your progression up to this point. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the first time that I even heard about the term stock market or investing was when I was a kid. So uh, from for people that don't know, I'm from Greece and, uh, you know, I grew up here and I'm still living here. So before the 2008 financial crisis, there was a major bull market here in Greece. So literally everyone was invested in stocks. All, all you could hear in family meetings and gatherings was you know, uh, was politics and stocks. Uh, so, yeah, but after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, which impacted Greece a lot, I mean, you could hear the, in the news, right? Uh, like bonds vanished, uh, stocks that were considered safe, you know, went to zero. So the people that made money were the people that were invested in the stock market. So everyone got destroyed. Um, so, yeah, after 2008, no one talked about the stock market. It was uh, black labeled, uh, and uh, yeah, I forgot about it. Um, so then, I, you know, I proceeded to my studies. So at the first year at the university, so I went to study food science and human nutrition at the agricultural university here in Athens. Uh, you know, and after a couple of months, you know, I kind of realized that it wasn't something that I, I couldn't picture myself five or 10 years, uh, you know, in the future to wear, you know, a white robe and uh, being in a factory facility and doing analysis on food. Mm -hmm. um, so I w also wanted to, to, to make some side income and I just Google search how to make money online, right? So yeah, I represent kind of the new generation of, of traders. So yeah, the first results that came into my feed were, you know, open up a store and do drop shipping or open up an Amazon store. And the third one was do trading and investing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I was always unconventional. So, you know, I said, this sounds cool. So yeah, that's how I started, you know, searching about uh, uh, trading and investing. Uh, but I was a lot of naive back then, right? So, yeah, I literally knew nothing about risk management, how to calculate my shares, how to put stops, charts, uh, how stocks move, fundamentals, like nothing. But I was 18, so I opened up a brokerage account and I I, uh, I was using leverage and I didn't know what it was, but because I was seeing the buying power and I was just, you know, buying things that I was seeing on Facebook groups and uh I was just reading. So yeah, I blew up my first account in a three in three days. Uh, and that really shocked me back then because it was the first time in my life that I got obliterated by something. I mean, I grew up as a kid um, having good gr grades and uh, being respected among family and friends. And, uh, uh, you know, it was the first time that I got destroyed by something in a short amount of time. So yeah, it was a traumatizing experience. And, and I think that's the reason that that I stuck to trading because it hurt my ego so much that I didn't want to accept it, right? Yeah. So after researching about trading, uh, you know, a bit, uh, you know, your feed, uh, and I mean, the, the ads that you're getting or your YouTube feed, 
you know, start shifting as well. Yeah. So, you know, and the, the, the people that you are getting on your feed in the form of ads or, you know, or YouTube or Facebook are not necessarily the best professionals out there when you're first starting out, right? And you can't you can determine who is good or who is bad. Uh, so, you know, I joined some services, some alert services back then, and, uh, you know, for all, from all these flashy people. Uh, and, of course, I was learning something new, like it's, it's day, it's week. I learned how to calculate shares, how to put stops, basic chart reading and patterns and, uh, you know, some basic fundamentals. So I gave it another go and I lasted a week. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so... A little better than three point, days. <laughs> yeah, right. So uh, that's the point that I said that I really need to invest in my knowledge. But again, I was naive. So the, the courses that I was buying were, you know, from, from all these flashy people, but... Of course, I was learning something new, right? I was learning new concepts and strategies and indicators and price action patterns and all this stuff. Um, but I was applying what these people were doing, their strategies, their you know, their concepts, but I was still in a drawdown. And it got to a point that, uh, and, and this is many months, you know, after I first started. Um, so, yeah, I, I wasn't risking that much. So I was just, you know, testing the waters. But again, I was still in a drawdown. So it got to a point that my the knowledge and the feedback that I was getting was uh, was saturated. I, I wasn't learning anything new. Mm-hmm. Um, so at that point, I said, you know, either I quit because this thing doesn't work, right? Or, uh, you know, I have to find the things on my own. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, that realization at this specific day back in 2016 um, is the reason that I'm here today. Uh, because I basically woke up the researcher in me and I said, you know, I'm not going to rely on others. I'm, I'm not going to sit in here. I'm going to sit here uh, being spoon fed by others. I'm not going to follow what other people are doing. I'm, I'm just, I will try to find some things on my own. I didn't know. I was, you know, completely lost. I didn't know how to search, but I just, you know, just that told to myself and basically waking up the researcher in me was really helpful. I think back then, because it's a tr- it's a trade that I still hold today, so I was lucky back then because I, as I told you, I was in ma- many Facebook groups, and there were some guys, um, you know, from Greece and Cyprus, and uh, they were posting their trades uh, on these Facebook groups, uh, and these guys were offering a course as well. But I said, you know, I'm, n- I'm never gonna buy a course anymore. I've done that. So um, what I did is I went up, and there was a log of one and a half for more years of these guys posting trades each day, watch list, specific teachers with entry stops, partials. Mm-hmm. Um, so I said, you know, the only way to basically understand what these guys were doing, because I liked what they were doing, and this is day trading, right? It's, it's still day, tra- day trading. So what I did is I tried to, to through the trades of these guys to reverse engineer their minds. Mm. So um, for months and months, I was just waking up, filling notes and notes, uh, going through these trades from the past. Uh, and I was doing that for months. Like I, I, wait, I was waking up, I was studying them trading or to, in trading. I, I wasn't, I was putting small risks, right? But just to get the feel of the real time and then studying again, then back to sleep. So by doing that for many months, that's what sparked my passion about trading. But because I didn't have a passion about trading, I, I you know, we all joined just to make money or be you know, financial free or to work without a boss. But at some point, you've got to find the passion. And yeah. I, I basically, you know, I, the the passion was sourcing from studying and trying to discover and reverse engineer, uh, you know, the minds of other people and ne- learning something new each and every day. And, and through this, you know, puzzle solving process is basically what sparked my passion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that's really important for all the people that are hearing this because, you know, and a good sanity check to see if you're passionate about trading is, you know, if if let's say tomorrow I make a trade and I make twenty million dollars, would would I retri- retire or would I con- uh, continue trading? And for me, the answer is obvious, right? Yep. I would still continue because I, I learned to love the game. But if you're quick to answer that you would retire, then you really need to find the passion, and you need to find the passion in something trading related without being necessarily to open and close trades. So for me, yeah, the, the source of my passion was, you know, studying and discovering things on my own. And it's important because there are going to be many times 
through your process that you're going to feel disgusted with yourself. I mean, yeah, the market is going to hit you like a train and you're going to feel lost. So you, you really need to have, you know, that flame going. So, yeah, I don't want to drift, you know, so much. But um, after months of doing, you know, this reverse engineering process, I started seeing some commonalities uh, based on these trades. And of course, I was learning new things by looking at the past. And I was using some uh, software that you can replicate past trading days. Uh, in real time. So, for example, there are some software that um, I don't want to plug it in here, but basically you can go back, let's say, three years ago in Microsoft and trade a specific day real time in whatever time frame you want. So, yeah, I was do using that software. And after many months, you know, I started seeing some commonality. So, for example, you know, oh, this guy sorted the stock because it had went 100 or 200% up in a matter of, you know, three, four consecutive days up. And then he sorted the exhaustion day. So, I remember, oh, I, I've seen that here, 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 and there. Or, you know, this guy went long on the stock because it had a catalyst and it was gapping up above a range. And I have seen that in this, in this, in this, and that day. So that's how I formed my first foundation around trading and specifically day trading. And of course, I learned new things about risk management. So uh, this foundation was the most, I was proud of it because I've made it, right? Yeah. It wasn't that it, I was spoon-fed on this concept. I, I tried to reverse engineer some people, but uh, all the discoveries and nuances were somewhat mine, right? So, yeah, that sparked my confidence as well. And I was able to close 2017 kind of break-even, which is was a milestone for me because I was always losing money. So, uh, I mean, break-even for, for this year, right? I, I didn't make the money that I had invested in courses or the first, you know, money that, uh, I had in my accounts. Uh, but yeah, uh, 2018 was a great year and it was the first year that I, I could actually recover from the courses and the money that I had invested. And uh, 2019 was my first triple digit year and it was uh, above mid, you know, triple digit. It was high mid, you know, triple digits. And uh, yeah, that was, that year was the best uh, for me because everything clicked and I was learning. I never stopped studying, right? And then... Um, you know, 2020 came and it was the best year uh, for everyone, uh, mm -hmm. including me, because I did really good in uh, the first months. But after, you know, mid-2020, I found myself in a in a really dark place mentally. And it, it wasn't because I wasn't doing good. My results were good, but I think it was, there were a lot of reasons subconsciously that I didn't want to fully admit and something wasn't clicking, right? And and it got to a point that I actually said that I'm, I'm probably gonna quit trading. Mm -hmm. So so what happened uh, for you to so uh, to explain this, those reasons? Basically, uh, for years, like for four years, I've done nothing else rather than you know waking up, studying, trading, studying, going to sleep. And, and I think I got to a point that I was burnt out. I, I mean, there were periods that I wasn't even going out of my house. I was going out of my house and my eyes were hurting from the sun. <laughs> I was looking at the mountains and I was seeing charts. So I said, you know, these along with the lockdowns at this period, I said, you know, I'm going crazy. This is this is not normal. I didn't join trading just to, to end up, you know, sick or ill or, you know, mentally uh, drained. Yeah. And um, yeah, so, so I think I got exhausted from, I went to the other level of over-obsession, right? Uh, yeah, so that that you know was hurtful, and uh, uh, you know I, I lost contact with a lot of friends. I, I was becoming I was becoming more lonely. But anyways, you know the second reason was uh, even though my equity curve was uptrending, it was far far from smooth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have a drawdown of ten percent in a matter of four, three, or even two days. Uh, and I think the reason for that was. At least for me, I'm, I'm not saying you know day trading is generally that way. But uh, from the way I, I was day trading, I was having my aids more on the win rate rather than you know risk to reward. And you know, being a day trader, you're, you're not necessarily in sync with the market like you are as a swing trader or a position trader. And you know, the market could shift, and the things that I was doing uh, weren't working. So for a matter, and, and my risk was large. I mean, I, I could have one percent or more risk at every given trade. So, uh, you know, the market would shift. My edge was lost, completely lost. And in a matter of three, four days, I could have a 10% drawdown. So you can understand that even though my equity curve was uptrending, I had to do many fixes. Yep. You know, there, I was lucky many times. Uh, and all these, you know, drawdowns brought a lot of 
emotional swings up and down. So I remember that I was, you know, having, I was literally depressed sometimes. I didn't want to talk to anyone. And I really thought that how I'm going to have a child or a family like five or 10 years from now and have a 10% road on how I'm going to have the energy to, to provide to this family and do other things in my life, right? And yeah, so that was the second reason. The third reason is I wasn't feeling that professional. Mm. So what I'm meaning, I mean by that is, you know, being a day trader, you, you and this is uh, has to do only with me, you know, how, how I see things. But, you know, being a day trader, you can't an outlier um, uh, related to the other people because if you are, you know, swing trading or position trading or even macro trading, you have a portfolio, right? And people were asking, asking me, what do you do? And I was telling them, I trade stocks. And so what stocks do you have? And I literally had no answer, right? They because they changed I wasn't every day. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't holding any stock. So it isn't that this, you know, you can be an outlier and you can be proud of it. But, you know, I spent so many years, so I, I kind of feel like to be part of a, a, a broader group, uh, not being, you know, an outlier. And yeah, so uh, the final reason was I remember being so pissed back in 2020 because uh, as I told, I was doing, you know, these catalyst gappers. Uh, so I didn't explain like like uh, the setups that I was doing back in my day trading days uh, where you know I was scanning for stocks uh, that basically when the market was, was closing weak or red I was scanning for some stocks that were showing a big relative strength within the day uh, that uh, big green day with a lot of volume that is closing above the hard to surpass you know resistance level or you know whatever le level you want uh, to say it but. Uh, and I was trying to take a trade on the next day so I can take advantage of the momentum continuation. Um, so that was one of my setups. And I call it that way. I call it momentum continuation. The other setup that I had was Catalyst Gapper. So I was doing what these days is called like episodic pivots yeah. or, you know, post-earning announcement drift uh, stocks or uh, breakaway gaps. I was doing that, but I was holding for one day. Yeah. So I remember that I was taking these trades and I got so pissed because... I saw so many times in 2020 that the stocks were moving up and up and up. Man, if I just held this stock for two weeks and I've done nothing else, I would have made more money than, uh, you know, buttoning around my entrance uh, every day. Yeah, so all of these reasons combined uh, got me to a point that I couldn't see myself doing that uh, for, for, or continue the way of, or, uh, that I was operating five or ten years from now. And uh, it was really bad. I mean... You know, when you when you already are some kind of professional and you are doing things and, and, and your results are good, it's really hard when something is not clicking. Mm. Uh, you know, because when you improve as a trader and you grow as a trader, you, the person who you are grows as well. So you're not going to be the same person that you were when you first started, you know, trading four or five years ago. So uh, when even if you don't realize this thing, these things need you know to kind of synchronize. The 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 person who you are with the per trading personality that you develop need need you know to reflect one another. So if they don't, something it, uh, won't click, and it's gonna create some pressure that it's gonna you know impact you at some point. So that that was the case for me. So I said you know i had literally ended up like I, I would probably quit so that was my the thought i was completely lost and i didn't know what to do um but i took a break and it was the first break that i, I have done um for many years and uh i was so angry and mad and i didn't even look at charts for a week but then i went to the books of uh, in, in my other house and you know i had the book of william o'neill how to make money in stocks and it was completely in dust because i had never read it <laughs> right <coughs> yeah so I took this book and I went through it in a couple of uh, days. And then I went to buy uh, Mark Minervini's uh, best-selling books. And I went through them uh, after a couple of weeks. And, you know, everything made sense. And uh, it was so compact together and it was overwhelming. But, you know, I, have already, uh, I had already experience in the market. Even though I was reading, you know, these new concepts, it wasn't new because after you, you go through so many charts for years, subconsciously you have seen these things. It's yeah. not, you know new but it was compacted together and uh, <clears throat> i really like this fresh new idea and uh, you know these are actionable books right you read them one time and you can put them right into action either you study the past or real time <clears throat> sorry for my cough but no worries you know uh, so that's what i did and um, 
uh, you know, everything made sense. So I knew a lot of things about fundamentals and earnings and, uh, uh, you know, sales and acceleration and all that stuff. And I, I was, uh, you know, the, uh, I was doing breakouts as well as a trade trader, but, you know, I started applying uh, this knowledge more and more because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't doing position sizing when I was day trading. Um, yeah, so I started applying this knowledge and I could grasp at it really quick. I mean, uh, right away, I could see immediate feedback uh, mm -hmm. that I was getting. You know, it, it took some time, but I basically tried to blend my best principles from my day trading past into the new knowledge that I was getting from these books. And, you know, after I, I, I've read Mark Minervini's books, you know, remember what I have done with the other guys that I, I reverse engineered? That's what I did with Mark. Like, I went to a website and downloaded, I put the Twitter handle and I downloaded all his tweets. Mm -hmm. So I filled, you know, notes and notes again with the past rage of Mark, tried to see why he did went long on that So what did he think? So, yeah, um, you know, the one thing that I didn't like is I didn't want to wait, uh, you know, one, two or three weeks just to make four or five hours because I was making three or four uh, hours in 30 minutes or even less. Day trading, yeah. So I said, yeah, so I said the only way for me to change is if I could actually do less and profit the same, right? So, yeah, that's how I started blending my my past, uh, you know, my trade trading day trading ta tactics into the swing trading. So basically, uh, instead of having my stop at the last contraction point of a VCP pattern, I was putting it at the low of the day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was taking, you know, these catalyst uh, gappers, the, the APs now called, and I was putting again my stop at the low of the day or even, you know, tighter. Um, and again, I was getting an immediate feel. That I never felt more relaxed. Uh, but again, I didn't know if I, I was doing the correct step, right? I, I, I speak, you know, now from because many years have passed. But uh, back then, I was again lost. I didn't know if this would work out. But I was, you know, happy that I found something new. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So uh, one thing that I liked when I shifted to swing trading is, you know, when you're day trading, you wake up, you go to your screens, and everything is a, a zero. You, you see a blank screen, and you have to make that screen green. And if it's green, it's okay. But if it's red, it's really hard to close that screen and do something else with your life. Right. But when I started swing trading, you know, I, I, I was opening my screen and I was swing, seeing full green because we, we can talk about this later. And I don't hold, you know, any red position overnight. So even if you do one or two trades wrong, uh, you know, you're still going to see screen. It's not, not going to affect you emotionally that big. So with day trading, you kind of feel like, you know, you lost the battle, but with swing trading, it's kind of a, a constant war. Mm. Uh, so it's it's different psychologically, and I, I really like that. And you know, I'm, I'm saying a lot of things about day trading, but you know, it just it just wasn't viable for me, right? There are many guys that have been doing that for decades, and they have a balance with their lives. It just wasn't viable for me, so I had to listen to myself. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, you know, I remember one day in late 2020 and a friend of mine said you know there's a guy on twitch that he's streaming uh, trading and i remember telling my friend is he a gamer or a streamer what what is this guy <laughs> so i didn't give any attention and after a couple of days i just you know pressed the link and that's how i found about christian kulamaji and you know i think christian was the right guy at the right time for me because as i said you know this change it wasn't i, I, I couldn't realize at this point that this change would be good for me or if it will end up you know well even though i was getting great feedback but i basically saw a guy that he's trained he's trading a behemoth amount of capital and he's kind of doing kind of the similar things that i'm doing and he's ended up with the same conclusions and uh, the, he has the same philosophical aspects about trading and uh, he has more years of experience than me right so that was a, an extreme confidence boost for me to finally realize, oh man, oh man, I can do it that for for years. Uh, many people have done it, right? And then you know, and and Christian was, you know, uh, it's good to to see how a trader reacts when when you have kind of the same teachers and another trader has the same teachers real time to kind of see how different your minds react to the same things. So yeah, it was really helpful finding Chris. And you know, after 2020 came to an end, then I found out about Oliver Kell and that's how I found about your channel and you know all the other uh, top performers like uh, Matthew Caruso and uh, Ryan Pierpont and uh, Thomas and all these guys and I, I finally felt related to a group you know yes. I finally said you know these people are, are are older than me and they have a balance with their lives and they can they are doing that for decades and I finally you know felt that actually I can do it 
Um, so basically, yeah, that's kind of my backstory and the rest is history. Uh, the only gap I had was in mid-2021 with mid-2022 that I had to go uh, to the army here in Greece because it's mandatory, right? You can't escape it, you have to go. And uh, I was happy to serve. And then, you know, the, the rest is history. I, I basically joined the competition for this year. Yeah, no, that that's a that's a great story. And, um, you know, outside, you mentioned how to make money in stocks. You mentioned uh, Mark's books, um, finding Christian Kualamagi's, uh, you know, Twitch stream and, and channel. Um, were there any other books or resources that really helped you in, in this transformation kind of from day trading to swing trading or just, you know, philosophically thinking about trading the right way? Yeah. Um, so I think there are many, many great books out there, but I, I, I kind of categorize the books into three different categories, right? There are, there are great story books uh, that you can read them and get inspired or uh, relate to some people. So these books are, you know, um, the Darva story, how I made $2 million in the stock market or the Mark, uh, Market Wizards book from Jack Swagger or, um, uh, you know, uh, there are some other and some unknown books like Phantom of the Pits. Not not many people know that book. And uh, um, yeah, so these are all you know great stories uh, or reminiscences of the stock market operator from Jesse Lieberman. Yeah, so these are all great story books. And then you have the actionable books, which is the second category. So there are, these are books that you read them one time and it becomes kind of a bible to you. You you go back so many times because you all, always you know, learn a new concept that you can right. apply, but you can apply this knowledge right away. You can put it into action, into real time or studying the past. So these two, these books kind of give you tools and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then the third category, which I think is the best, is, you know, the books that you write yourself for yourself. And these are the books that truly really save you. What I mean by that is, you know, when you're studying the stock market, you're going to write many books for yourself. These are not books that are meant to be published, right? You write them for yourself. So I've written many books. So I rem remember I told you about the notes that I had from these people that I was a reverse engineering. And I, in my other house, I have a book that I printed with Mark Winner Venus trades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have it right here. This is, you know, a book that is called Analysis of a High Performance from the Past that is full of charts and examples that, of high performance with notes. And, uh, you know, there's also a heavy book right here, which is filled... Uh, with notes from Christian streams, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that compiled together. So these are the books that truly save you. These are the books that give you the true confidence. And these are the books that you are most proud of. Uh, so I think, you know, you read the, the great story books to get inspired, then you need some tools. So you read the actionable books. And then the books that you write yourself uh, for yourself are the books that shape these tools in order for you to do something great with them, right? right. So at least that's the way I'm, I think about books. Yeah, no, I, I think that's perfect. And, you know, a commonality among all the traders who I've interviewed who have had success is they've they've put in the work, they've studied, you know, a few setups, you know, th there's the same story over and over. And yeah, they've written these books from themselves that help characterize their trading, uh, make sure they're always on the right track, studying history, what worked in the past. Um, and yeah, just kind of specializing. Um, do you have any advice for people? Uh, I, I love how you talked about, you know, going back, looking at Mark's trades, uh, the, the other people's <clears> trades, <throat> uh, any advice for people doing that to get the most out of it or, or to, yeah, to see the most benefit out of, you know, studying somebody else's work. Yeah. So, you know, I think studying and uh, doing the, the, the work for yourself is a, a really great source of passion. I mean, I told you before, so, um, to effectively do it, you, you you basically, you know, you have to have a, a charting platform and then you have to uh, start, you know, seeing uh, the setups that work the best and go back in, in the past and uh, verify those things. And you will see that after you do it, uh, after a couple of days or weeks, it usually takes, you know, 21 days to, to, to get to a new kind of, uh, you know, uh, to basically have a new, you know, um, New realization. That's yeah, new realization yeah. of something mm -hmm. and stick to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, if you start to, there are a ton of things that you can study. You can study books, you can study uh, traders, you can study, you know, a concept that you read on Twitter and you need to run an experiment to verify it. But, you know, st studying is a core part of, of my trading routine. So I learned to love the game through studying and, and, and I there were many times that I didn't want to study uh, but I, I pressure myself to study, and then it, it becomes, becomes a tradition. Yeah. Uh, 
And then you will see that you will really, really love the game through studying. Um, so there are many ways that you can do that effectively, right? But you, you need, really need a charting platform that you can go to the past. And uh, um, yeah, you really need to, to stick to it and uh, do it every day and be a part of your routine because trading is really like a sport. I, I, I treat trading like it's a sport. You may perform for one or two hours, which is trading, right? But there's a lot of trade training and preparation. So that training and preparation is, you know, doing the study. So for the people that are listening, start, you know, take a concept, let's say breakouts or take another concept like any other setup or take a, a trader and study his trades. Do that for a couple of weeks and you will see that this problem solving and this, you know, mindset of improving each and every day and learning something new every day is so much self-rewarding that you're going to do it for life. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, specifically about uh, Christian Kualamagi, um, I'd be curious to hear kind of your, the biggest takeaways or, or the most impactful things that you learned from studying him and how he trades. Uh, obviously, your styles are, are pretty similar, but, you know, looking back, watching his streams, you know, looking back at his previous trades, uh, what were some of the key things that you took away that now you apply um, to your own process? Yeah, so I really liked, you know, the work ethic of Christian and uh, I could relate to that, that, you know, he studied the past. He did the work for himself. He didn't rely on others. He he was learning a new concept from one person and then he was moving to the next one. And I'm still, you know, learning new things. I mean, the, the mentors are not always the people that, you know, are better than you or have more years of experience than you. There are mentors could be, you know, new people that have, you know, one or two years experience in the market, but maybe have came come up with something uh, clever or a, a good idea. Yeah. 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 Um, so I really like, you know, the work ethic of Christian. And I really like that he, you know, the mentality that he had on, 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 on uh, crisis moments, you know, because trading is not always easy. They're going to, every year there are going to be trades that they're going to have written your name on them. So they're going to drive you crazy and they're going to test your limits. And I really liked watching Christian, you know, having, you know, that uh, peace of mind on this kind of situations. And, uh, basically, I, I really liked his bookkeeping. So, you know, having notes on his charts and uh, keeping back watch lists uh, so you can go back and do post analysis and, uh, you know, his scanning process. I mean, I, I really like this stuff. So that's, uh, you know, some of the stuff that I really kept and still, uh, you know, apply today. Yeah, perfect. And um, bring me to, uh, bring me back to the late end of 2022, uh, and actually deciding to join the contest, what were kind of your motivations behind that? What were you tr were you trying to get more accountability? You wanted to kind of prove to yourself what what was what kind of uh, contributed to your decision to actually join uh, the contest, which obviously you've done tremendously well in. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so I didn't plan to join the competition beforehand. So what happened is uh, it was around twenty fifth of January, twenty twenty three, and. Uh, I thought that, you know, another guy had won championship and then I went, uh, I saw, uh, you know, uh, the po a post about Afzal winning it. And I went to the website to verify that. And, uh, you know, I saw a big pop-up window saying you can still join the competition. Uh, I didn't know you can join late uh, on January. I thought you have to enter, you know, uh, from last year. So I said, what if I join? Like, <laughs> uh, what if I join? So I went to, to, you know, to the previous standings and I saw the people and I could try to relate where I would be uh, on the previous year. And uh, all, almost all years I would be, you know, at least in the top 10. So I went to my girlfriend and I told her, you know, I'm thinking of uh, joining a competition. And she said, uh, how long will it last? And I told her, it's, it's one year, it's one full year. And she said to me, you know, you worked so hard to be more relaxed and uh, uh, less stressed and now you want to be stressed for a full year. <laughs> so... Yeah, I went back to my desktop and uh, it was circling through my mind again and again and again. And I said, you know what? I I'm going to join. I'm, I'm, gonna I'm just going to do what I would do normally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I will just forget about it and I just press the click and join. So yeah, I didn't join to go to, to win it, right? I didn't join to, to go for the win. My goal was, you know, I don't know, prove my mom or, or myself or my friends that I'm good. And my goal was to put up a good year by respecting my rules and setups and uh you know, do, do uh, be my, my best self every day and, uh, you know, have a good year. And I really don't get why, why people, you know, are scared of joining or, or so obsessed about winning it. I mean, you know, 
your goal should be to put up a good year for yourself to do, do the mm-hmm. things that you're best at do uh, you know and um, if in order to win it you have to abandon some of your core rules or to win it or be ranked among the best right you have to 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 abandon some of your core rules or do you know jungle trading or over trading or you know do many mistakes uh, there's no worth of it because the competition lasts for only one year but your long term success is a lifetime process right yeah. so yeah if if you abandon some of your core rules and you do, do many fixes just to be ranked among the best uh, what are you going to do you know after the competition ends are you going to go back to default setting so yeah just forget like for people that are thinking of joining forget you know about the the best performance i mean it's nothing you know the, the titles the designations so all these don't give you financial freedom it's it's you know it's your long term process that is going to give you that so yeah if you are thinking of joining join and all the people that were able to beat the index and are on the list this year and the previous year deserve a big applause uh, and for all the people that are already on the spotlight you know on twitter or on other platforms and are thinking of joining i think they should join as well i mean i find it less time consuming and far less stressful. i mean i'm more scared to write five tweets uh, you know that do my actual work so you know the people that are already on the spotlight uh, and thinking of joining you should join it would, would be far less time consuming and far less mentally draining it's just you yourself nothing else so yeah i think it's a great opportunity for everyone and i wouldn't be sitting here if, if i didn't join right uh, but yeah try to do what i would normally do i, I uh, and that's what i did for the year year yeah uh no great and from kind of a high level perspective, could you kind of describe your strategy and like how much of it is fundamental based, how much of it is price action based? Um, you know, obviously a, a big influence is Qualmagi, but you mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, O'Neill, who's a lot more fundamental. So, you know, looking at your current strategy, how would you describe it from a high level? And then obviously we're going to dive deeper into your setups and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it's good to kind of set the stage for everybody. Uh, so I have, you know, kind of three main setups. So I will just, you know, sp- split my screen into three parts. Um, so the first setup that I'm doing is, you know, the classic breakout. So you can have a chart like this, you know, and then you get uh, a big leg up and then, you know, you get a, an accumulation to the right side and the chart is getting, you know, tighter and tighter. And I basically, you know, want to take uh, a long on this specific day right here, right? Um, and maybe, you know, the, the moving coverage are, are co-aligning uh, with the formation. So up oh, right sorry so yeah this you know you can have you know some moving coverage co aligning on the right side mm-hmm. of the setup so you know this is one of my setups is the classic breakouts uh, but I'm, I'm trying to do that you know not randomly but on the momentum leaders okay mm-hmm. so you know that's one of my setups the second setup is you know what we call now as uh, episodic pivots um, or post turning announcement briefs uh, so basically, you have, you know, information on the daily chart. And let me clarify, this is daily, right? Uh, so this is kind of a representation of the daily chart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you get, you know, a gap up because of a catalyst on uh, a day. So I basically want to go long on this specific day, right? And usually these setups uh, many times would continue, you know, to move uh, higher, uh, over the next day. So this is, you know, a phenomenon that ho- was also studied academically as post earnings an- announcement drifts. So I really like this setup. And, uh, you know, the last setup that I do is you can have a daily chart that is looking like this. So it can be an IPO or just randomly a stock. And then within a, f- uh, a small time frame, it shoots up parabolically. Mm-hmm. And then I'm trying, you know, to take a short on the exhaustion day um, right here. Right, because these stocks have, you know, on the if you get them on the exhaustion day, you can have a move like 30, 40, 50 percent. Uh, if it's an IPO, it's more to closer to the 50 percent. But I really like this setup, so yeah, I'm trying to take this on this specific day. Uh, and you know, the episodic pivots on the first day of the catalyst gapper, and you know, the breakout setup, but, but there are many variations of the same setups, right? I mean, this has many variations and this has many variations i mean i can get you know on the second day or i can wait uh for a sideways formation and then you know uh, wait for the 10 uh, moving coverage or 20 moving coverage to call line and then go long so there are many many variations of the same setups and on this one as well uh so think of this like the core but there are many branches out of them right 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 um yeah so these are kind of my setups and the way i, I like the setups 
is first of all this one I was doing from my past earning, uh, past day, day trading days. So uh, I have a lot of experience with it, right? But I kind of understand why this setup is secure. So, uh, for example, you know, breakouts are secure because they, they worked 100 years from now, they worked 50 years from now, they work now, they will continue to work because uh, they, they, they respect the rule of supply and demand. This is how supply and demand is represented, you know, in a visual form. So right. basically, you have a liquidity drain. That's why, why you have this accumulation on the right side. And then after liquidity drains, you can have, you know, a day that shoots up. Or, you know, this day uh, on the episodic pivots, you know, we don't move the stock market. I mean, the funds or, you know, the the, uh, the institutions move the market. And these, you know, funds usually have macro, you know, models to to uh, uh, to, to evaluate the stocks, right? So, yeah, these kind of institutions and macro ha funds have, you know, uh, big valuation models. Maybe there are discounted cash flows. So what happens when there's a big surprise or earnings or, you know, a, a different catalyst is some of these models are, are, are going to change. So, for example, if this stock, you know, maybe before the catalyst at this, you know, specific price, it was maybe considered, you know, uh, overvalued. Mm -hmm. But after the catalyst, something changed. And maybe it's it is considered undervalued even if, even uh, at this price, right? right? So this is you know the fuel uh, that pushes the stocks up, and usually you know these institutions take many months or weeks just to build a position because they're moving billions. So I really like those setups because uh, I, I've seen them in the past that they work. Many people are doing them and had great success. I had great success with them, and I kind of understand. You don't need, need to necessarily understand what is happening. But uh, uh, I like uh, like that I basically can understand some of these things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are kind of my setups just to visualize them. Yeah. Perfect. And um, the parabolic short—that's th something that I know Christian trades. Is that is that where you learned that particular setup? No, no. I was trading that setup uh, from my past trading days, right? It was one of the first setups that I had. Uh, so after finding that Chris was using it as well, so I was extremely happy and I was basically kind of refined it extra mm -hmm. uh, because there are many, many variations of this setup and it's, I mean guys, you, you don't need to trade that setup uh, that catching the top of a move is one of the hardest things to do in the stock market or catching the bottom, right? Uh, so you really need to, to have a lot of details just to be able to to, to be sure, sure, you're never sure, but to be able to catch this move to say maybe it's going to break today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot, a lot of variations. And uh, yeah, you don't need to necessarily trade the setup, but even learning, you know, some of the criteria can help you, even if you're on the long side of maybe a thematic move, can help you take some partials uh, before the, the stock, you know, depressurizes and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. reverses really hard. Uh, but again, you know, a stock. Can can drop a hundred percent, but it can go up, you know, a thousand or two thousand percent. So, yeah, you really need to be careful with these setups. And uh, I learned not to be, you know, uh, obsessed when I'm, I'm taking or you know, uh, get attached to the things that I'm taking when I trade this setup because it can really ruin your account. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I wouldn't, you know, say to people to to try to master the setup first. Uh, there are many other things that you can uh, you don't need to trade the setup to to, to have an outperformance i just like to take it because it kind of smoothens out my equity curve and uh, you know it's kind of a cool thing to catch you know <laughs> these moves and uh, it's a quick risk to reward uh, i mean there are many trades even this year that i was able to make seven or eight percent of my account in a single day mm -hmm. uh, so yeah it's a thing that i kept from the past and i refined it uh, up until now yeah great and uh Break down your layout for me here. How did you kind of have this organized and how do you kind of use uh, each different component of uh, in your chart layout? Yeah, so basically uh, what you're seeing right now is on the left side, I have uh, the intraday chart and I have, you know, one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes and the hourly. And I have some big basic indicators here like VWAP and some exponential moving averages. Mm -hmm. And on the right side, I have the daily chart. So I can shift through daily and weekly uh, real fast, okay? Um, yeah, so below I have, you know, the dollar volume and the volume. And I think this I got from you guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it called enhanced volume? Yep, yep. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I got it from you guys. So basically, you know, you can see the volume uh, if it's showing some rel relative strength in terms of volume uh, 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 relative to the other days. And, uh, you know, 
in some cases, you're going to get a blue, uh, purple dot right here, which says uh, this is the best volume, the, the biggest volume uh, within a one year period. Mm -hmm. um, so on my daily charts, as you can see, I have a couple of moving averages, but I, I try to keep it simple. So, um, you know, I have the 10, 20, 50, 100, 150, and 200 mm -hmm. moving averages, and nothing else. Like, this is all I need uh, in my daily chart and the volume, you know, uh, below. I don't use any other indicators, just the moving averages and the volume. And, um, you know, the other things that you see is, you know, I have some extra details right here about the capitalization or when are the next earnings or, you know, the average daily range. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, how much an average stocks move within a, a day period. And it takes, you know, 20 day periods to, to uh, end up with this percentage. And on the right side is the ATR. So this is, you know, expressed in the form of dollars. So how much usually a stock, uh, how many dollars usually a stock moves within a day. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my layout. And this is... Um, you know, this is uh, my charting platform, right? I, I don't use it uh, to execute any trade. So just look at uh, to to read the charts. Mm -hmm. um, and this is my execution, you know, a layout. So um, I have a, a lot of layers. Like here, you can uh, see that this is where my screens and scans are uh, for the my swing, you know, uh, for my swings. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of scans as well here, which is more uh, of, you know, a, a 10 or 20 minutes before the market opens uh, in pre-market. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have another uh, other layouts right? to study the past. I have, you know, uh, uh, other screens. But, you know, the main ones are this, which is the execution window. So here I have my positions and I have some uh, intraday scanners here as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, yeah, this swing scan, which are my uh, base, the, my most swing scans in this pre-market that I, I kind of go over uh, 10 or 20 minutes before the stock market opens. So let me know if you want any other details about, you know, uh, how things look and uh, if you have any questions regarding to that. Yeah, I think I think that's great. Uh, what I'd love to hear now is kind of um, if you could break down your routines for me. So maybe starting with the with the weekly routine, what do you do to, you know, both analyze the market if, if that's part of your process to get, you know, situational awareness, as well as, you know, come up with that, the, the, the focus list for what you want to, you know, focus <laughs> on the next week. Yeah, so great. Um, so I break down my routine into three different parts. It's, you know, as you said, my daily routine, the weekly routine, and I also have studying, but I don't want to go to studying. We already analyzed that, right? So um, I would prefer if I could start with my daily routine and then Please. we can go to weekly so we can add some more things. Yeah. So what I do basically is uh, I'm lucky because I'm here in Greece and the stock market opens at midday. So I have all the morning to prepare mm -hmm. and do, you know, study and do other things. Uh, so basically, what I do when I wake up is I open up this charting platform and, uh, uh, and you know, when the pre-market opens, I basically check if there's anything uh, weird that happened within my positions. Maybe, you know, a stock gapped up or something gapped down. This really rarely happens, but it happens. So I want to know, you know, if something uh, uh, new or, uh, you know, a surprise happened within the, the stocks that I hold. Uh, maybe some, something, you know, on pre-market. Um, you know, then when I, uh, I open some major websites to, to check, you know, the general global news, if there are something, you know, uh, something big that happened globally. But all these things, you know, rarely happen. But I just like to have that process um, every day. And then I, I get serious, like um, basically one hour or one and a half hour be before the stock market opens. Uh, I, I go and I open this screen right here, which is called the swing scans. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I have in here is, uh, you know, I have the one month gainers, the mm -hmm. three month gainers and the six month gainers. So this is something that many people are aware. So basically what these scans do is they filter, uh, you know, uh, the universe that you have built in. Maybe it's, you know, only the US stocks, but I have a broader universe. So basically it filters and, and gives you stocks that are showing, you know, relative strength over the market within one month, three months, six month period. So that's how I kind of find about, you know, the momentum leaders that I, I, I like. And I say momentum leaders because I'm not always focused on growth stocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, momentum leaders in a period can be even, you know, um, commodities names, commodity names, or, or any... So I'm, I'm focused on momentum leaders and I'm just trying, you know, to see what's going on every single day. So I'm really... Basically, here are, you know, 200 stocks maybe in here or 
let me close you know the post market because it uses uh, it really work, works when the post market is closed yeah so uh, basically what happens here is you, you, I go through the the charts real quick and you know if you if you have spent enough time studying stocks uh, you're gonna determine what's looking good right away right, right? Uh, so I, I can't just to, 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 to try to pick my mind it's I basically look at the the formation on the right side of the chart mm -hmm. uh, to see and I basically you know with a quick glance I can see if this you know stands up greatly is linear or the vo if the volume has picked up or what is the general uh, you know formation or, uh, in the past so within a few seconds I can see if some of uh, of these names I, I want to put them on my list right so mm -hmm. I'm searching for stocks that you know have shown uh, you know. Strength. That seem hungry, right? That, that they, they they had a leg up, they have moved up, up a lot with a relative strength, generally relative mm -hmm. strength over the market, and they are kind of tightening up on the right side, mm -hmm. right? And the volume maybe has picked up, and the formation is kind of linear, and maybe they respected, you know, the moving the trailing moving averages. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to to gauge when I go through these scans, right? Um, so I go through each and every one of these uh, one month gainers and whatever stock I like, uh, maybe, you know, it's not even tight at, uh, at um, you know, at the, that point, but maybe I like, you know, the daily chart, maybe, you know, it has went up a lot and uh, it's, it's looking linear and the volume is good and the overall star, uh, chart looks good. What I'm mm -hmm. going to do is I'm going to copy, you know, that, that specific ticker. I'm going to copy it to a list that I call, you know, a bulk list. Mm -hmm. So every ticker that I like, I'm going to basically copy to this broader list, uh, watch list, of, uh, and this consists of all the stocks and, that I like, right? So I go through these one-month gainers, and I go through, uh, through these three-month gainers and six-month gainers, and I basically put all the stocks that I like into this bulk list. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this bulk list kind of represents my, my fine, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the the elite of my of the setups yeah. at this period. So... I really go through uh, hundreds, maybe it's in a thousand uh, uh, charts and stocks each and every day because I really want to know what is happening. I, mm -hmm. I may not be aggressive or I may not even trade, you know, uh, aggressively or, you know, I may not even take the trades that I'm seeing, but I just want to know what's happening. Right. So I have uh, another, you know, scan, which is called the weak gainer. So this is stocks that have moved really good within a week uh, time, uh, time frame period. Uh, so if I see something like the, uh, out of these names that I really like, I'm going to put it, you know, on my bulk list as well. And mm -hmm. this is a scan that I developed kind of myself. And uh, it basically scans for stocks that are showing, um, you know, uh, a big volume on the past uh, month relative to, you know, the overall past. So mm -hmm. through here, I was able to find some pretty cool names uh, uh, this year, like Carvana, when even it, when it first started out, like, uh, you know, back in January. Yeah. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, it was January, February. Right. So uh, this can has helped me pick up some stock this year that maybe were beaten down for a long time. And then, you know, start a volume started picking up and then maybe they were escaping this long-term you know a beaten down range and uh, uh yeah i was kind of uh, you know able to find some of the stocks that were you know in the phase one ready to jump into the phase two mm -hmm. uh, of the cycle and uh yeah i had great great success with this scan and uh, yeah it, this is for the breakouts right uh, uh, so everything that i like I, I just put it on the bulk list and the bulk list is is meant for the uh, generally the breakouts okay mm -hmm. Uh, and I have also these IPO scans that I just check for uh, fresh uh, IPOs. Mm -hmm. So after I, I complete, you know, the scan that I run every single day and I go through every stock, I basically go to my other screen, which is called the pre-market uh, screen. And what I do here is uh, I've developed some scans that basically can give you uh, price formations that look uh, like, uh, you know, a flag within... Mm -hmm. A three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, day periods, and I have this going up to twenty. So, uh, if something, if I can't find something uh, with the previous scans, maybe I can find the find it in here, right? Uh, so, as I told you before, I, I really want to see what's going on mm -hmm. uh, every single day. 
So yeah, around this scan, and also I like this scan. So this scan is remember I told you about uh, the momentum continuation type of name. So I basically run rarely this scan to find stocks that are have showing a big relative strength uh, day within one day period when the market maybe was closing weak or red. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't of run through this scan as well. So yeah, everything that I like from this scan it goes to the bulk list. Then what I will do is I will open up you know this this bulk list. And I will go through every single one of the trades that I have here. So this I build uh, for a week. After mm -hmm. one week, I will just you know open it up and I will do some clearing and I will mm -hmm. put new stocks on it, right? Mm -hmm. So every single day, I will not already have a, a big bulk list and then maybe I would uh, have added some extra names. So I will go through each uh, of these names. And if there's something that is close to breaking out, so what I'm trying to look, and I told you before is, I'm trying to look at the accumulation on the right side. So I really want to see the chart becoming tighter and tighter. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason for this, as I told you, is, you know, pure supply and demand. So basically, uh, you know, what, why this happens is imagine when the stock, you know, is moving up. Uh, so at some point, maybe it's going to hit, you know, a brick wall of sell orders at some point. So, the, you know, there's a, a brick wall of, supp of supply at, at this point. So that's why, you know, uh, the stock maybe reverses, mm -hmm. right? So you can imagine that as a, as a brick of, of, of uh, selling orders. So what happens and why the stock, you know, maybe pushes up and then reverses back down and then pushes up and then maybe reverses back down and it's pretty higher lows is basically, uh, you know, every time the stock is hitting, you know, this brick wall of selling orders, a buying order is going to find the selling orders and it's going to, you know, uh, extinguish oneself, uh, one, uh, oneself out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so after a couple of times that the stock pulls up, pushes up, and then you know takes some selling orders, and then again and again, and it's showing some strength, this wall is gonna become a thin layer. So even with a small you know amount of volume or pressure on the on the long side, it can move to higher grounds. So that's what I'm trying to to, to basically check uh, from the stocks that I'm I'm seeing on the on the bulk list mm -hmm. to put them you know on my intraday focus list. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanna be really you know. Um, patient to, to 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 be for the chart to be extremely tight so i can be more kind of sure you're never sure but you know more you know the, the, the chances are you know the, the the stock can really push through that, that wall easier and move to higher grounds right right so yeah basically what is close to breaking out and the the the, the chart is looking really tight i will just put a trend line where i think the core of the move is so you know these ups and downs i kind of see, see them as noise Right. Mm -hmm. So I will just try to picture where the core or, you know, the meat of the move is. And I will just draw, draw a trend line and I will just put an alert on it. So that's really simple. Right. Everything that looks good and maybe is going to break out today or tomorrow is going to go to my intraday focus list. Mm -hmm. OK, so after that, what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, I will just have a focus list. And as you can see, I have, you know, a focus list maybe for every single day, right? And how many uh, names are usually on that focus list uh, just in general? Yeah, so it depends. Sometimes are, you know, five or six, or sometimes are 10 names up, but you're, there are, uh, rarely are more than 12 or 13 names. Yep. I mean, I could have 12 or 13 names from the best market period that uh, is really favorable. And mm -hmm. I'm using, and I can tell you on the weekly routine how I'm using this past watch list uh, that I'm keeping each every, every day to kind of understand the breadth of the market and, uh, maybe gain some clues of other things, but mm -hmm. yeah. So this is for the breakouts. Everything that I like, I just I just draw a trend line and I, I and I just wait. And what I do is, um, after I finish the breakout, you know, I open up some uh, websites that uh, they show pre-market what stocks are gapping up. Mm -hmm. Right, so you can short th these stocks based on earnings, and generally gapping up on a on a, uh, a certain catalyst, right? So I go through, I short this list based on the change of the pre-market action. Uh, and I try to see what stock has, you know, picked up in volume and uh, has gap, gapped up a lot. And uh, that's how I found about, uh, that's how I found the names for my episodic pivots, right? Or the breakaway right. gaps or the catalyst gappers that I call them. Um, so basically, uh, when it's turning season, I will just look through all these names and I will uh, try to see what's the, the reason of this gap up. Is it, you know, a big surprise is it, uh, you know, a restructure of the business, a new CEO, 
if it's a biotic, if it's a new drug or an FDA approval, I will just try to see what the catalyst is. Mm. So whatever I, I, I like from this list, so generally I try to find you know stocks that are gapping up more than 5%, generally in a escaping uh, pre-market from a range that they have been for many months mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in the previous, you know, uh, price, uh, the previous action. And I will just try to find, uh, you know, what's the reason beca- behind this uh, move. So I really try to find, you know, these are prizes and uh, maybe, you know, the stock is raising the guidance for the year and uh, uh, all this kind of uh, stuff that re- is really the fuel um, for, the, for the move. Uh, so th- just now, remember that you asked me what's fa- what's my process? Is it fundamental? Is it technicals? So yeah, it's a blend of both, mm-hmm. right? So I- I'm not gonna make a decision purely based on fundamentals. Uh, I mean, the fundamentals are the fuel, and then you check the price action to see if that fuel is used for the move, right? If that fuel has was put into action. So through price action, you're able to see, you know, the the footprints of you know maybe some institutions and. Without even looking at fundamentals, when the stock is, you know, going up and it's printing volume, you know that something good is happening there. You don't need to be, you know, Einstein to to to, to actually understand that something is going on this stock. So yeah, but I, I really like, you know, seeing uh, good estimates or a big surprise or uh, the stock raising its guidance or you know having an acceleration of earnings per share or more specifically in sales because I really like sales, you know, and we we got that this year a lot. You know, after the bear market of 2022 and the the rate hikes, there were many, were many uh, you know companies that um, you know were beaten down and they had to do some layoffs, and you know sales are, are really important because a company can cook some somehow the the earnings. They can mm-hmm. you know uh, lay off some uh, you know uh, uh, some employees or do some uh, reduce the cost and you know uh, show big earnings. But if you know, they don't have sales at some point, something is going to break. So, yeah, I'm looking at earnings. And, you know, some news, like if you had the news of layoffs uh, two or three years from now, it would have been a bad news, right? But this year, sometimes it was, it, good, it was yeah. a good news. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, you really need to be adaptive about those things. And uh, it takes some time to generally understand what's a good news or what's bad. Uh, but I really like to see, you know, uh, acceleration on earnings or sales and uh, triple digit earnings and uh, maybe you have you have an estimate for the next year and there uh, what's a, what's is called breakout year so maybe you know you have an earnings per share of zero point two percent two dollars right and then the estimate for the year and the next year is maybe you know one dollar right. so this is you know a big change on estimates so this is this is the fuel mm-hmm. right. Um, yeah, so I found that's how I find about the breakaway gaps or catalyst gappers, and I put them on my focus list. And uh, then, you know, I try to to do some more analysis about uh, what's happening in the name that I have uh, I have on my list. Is it you know what industry is it? What sector is it? Uh, is it a theme play? I'm really on the on hunt for the theme plays always, mm. right? Because these are the best. You know, you can do nothing else within the year. You can just get. You know, some theme plays that we have every year, right? And you can outperform the market. So I really hunt for these themes. So is it a theme? Uh, I, I use ChatGPT to kind of uh, have, you know, some small summaries about every stock that I, I have. So this helps me, you know, understand if it's uh, indeed theme related of, of generally to understand the news better, right? So as you can see, like every stock that I have, uh, I basically have a small summary and it's basically yep. I, I can understand where where yeah where is uh, is it a theme move what sector is it what industry and basically understand the flow of the news better yeah so that's my process um uh, i think i uh, i hope that, that you can understand yeah, yeah. kind of understand it yeah no for sure uh, I've, got, I've got some questions if, if you don't mind yeah um, yeah going back to uh your swing scans uh i really mm-hmm. love the idea of uh your 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 dense volume screen mm-hmm. just because you know that that volume signature is key it's like it the stock is is waking up right it's it's getting hungry as you put it yeah right. um do, do you mind sharing the criteria for for that yeah yeah, yeah i can open my criteria yeah. for everything and i can share them on twitter yeah, or, you know i'm maybe sure people later. Will be interested yeah but it's really simple it's it's really simple so basically you know i kind of uh take the average volume of 40 days uh 
uh, related to you know of the volume within one year with in a percentage, and I try to rank them with the ten uh, percent of the best you know names, yeah. right? And I just you know the other things are just simple criteria like the price above one dollars because I generally like you know to take things above one dollars and average daily range of more than five. You like when the I fast find, moves. Yeah, yeah. When you yeah. find this, uh, usually the most of the names that are gonna pop up on this uh, screen, and that's why I built it for this year, is, you know, there were many stocks that were beaten down due to the bear market. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, I was able to find, you know, as I said, many stocks that were on phase one trying to go to the phase two. So I really want, you know, for this stock to be fast and have, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of volume. And the other thing is, um, you know, the, the dollar volume. So I wanted to be... I think there's a, a mistake in, in this platform and this, I think it means... It's like a, it's in million. millions. Yeah. yeah, it's it's in thousands, I think. So yeah. That, right, that, right. T- so 10 million, this is yeah. above 1 million uh, average, uh, I'm sorry, dollar volume uh, within one day period, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or there, I have it... No, yeah. I have it on the average, right? Sorry, my mistake. Yeah, yeah. Is there a, a lower liquidity threshold that you need to meet in terms of dollar volume to get involved or... Uh, it doesn't matter too much to you what the dollar yeah, so, is. Uh, of course, I, I'm always trying to, you know, to be on the really, really liquid name. So I'm not going to take something that, you know, every day, maybe it's on the scan. So this scan means, you know, you have a lot of volume uh, yeah. in the couple of uh, 20, maybe uh, 30 on, within the last month. So if there's a lot of volume and the volume is, you know, 200,000 uh, uh, shares, so let's say dollar volume or you know, $2 million volume or $1 million volume, oh, sorry, less than $1 million volumes within a day, I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to put it on my list. I may look at it just to get an idea. But I really like the liquid stuff because yeah. uh, what I do, I want to be able to do it, you know, uh, even 10 years from now. Right. Right. So with uh, an extreme amount of capital, uh, many, many, many millions. And uh, yeah, I try to, to also focus on... Uh, uh, you know, these liquid names, but I just have the th- threshold low so I can spot all the things because, you know, b- besides trading, I use some uh, discounts to basically create back watch list that I'm studying just to understand the setups better, right? Yeah. So as you can see right here, I have for all the months, uh, you know, stocks that to study from April, August, December, February, like uh, I may find something that w- looks great and I might put it on this list just to study it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's why I have the threshold low. And something that be might be really cool is, could you kind of talk through your process uh, for how you developed or kind of you know tweak these screens from somebody else? Uh, how do you kind of come up with these screens that you know look for specific situations that you like to trade? Yeah, so uh, most of the screens are, are actually landed uh, from other guys. Like some of them I found on Twitter, on or you know uh, some of them are from Christian or other people, uh, but. You know, at some point, I might look at the charts and uh, I might see something new, like that it's happening and it might never have, have happened uh, in the past. So, for mm-hmm. example, you know, in, within this three-year period, we had 2020, 21, 22, and 23, the market has shifted so much. We see so many different, you know, periods and many different things and branches of, you know, of the core setups work. So I remember, you know, to, to, to make this dense volume scan, I was seeing, you know, many times that, you know, these names that, that are beaten down for years uh, are emerging and uh, I, I could see the volume footprints, right? So I tried to see, okay, what's the most visual thing I, I can I can see when I'm looking at the screen? So, oh, volume. So I have to write, you know, something about volume and, uh, you know, what are the um, what are the other things that I might see? So uh, maybe, it's, you know, it's a, a move at, uh, for parabolic moves that I have also, you know, here that this is a scan I made myself. So basically, I'm trying to scan for moves that are bigger than 100% up. So I'm going to put it uh, on that screen, right? So mm-hmm. I basically, I try to find some of the most general uh, criteria I can find. Uh, and then I can kind of refine, uh, you know, the scans through 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 the Trial days. There. But it's not, it's not you know, rocket science. I, if, you, if I open up all my scans, are simple, simple criteria. You mm-hmm. might see that there are a lot of scans, but basically it's for the pers- purpose that I want to uh, see everything that is going so I can be better synchronized with the market. Everything is simple. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's the most, you know, simple and dumb ideas. Yeah, no, that, that's super helpful. Um, 
Awesome. Was there anything else with your daily routine that you wanted to cover or, um, or anything else with your, with your weekly routine that you kind of do a diff little, little bit differently? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about weekly. So uh, weekly is kind of the bookkeeping for me and, um, you know, studying better or, you know, uh, um, filling that gap of information that I may have lost, uh, within, you know, the daily action because, you know, you're trading as well. So what I will do on weekly is I would basically run the scans, uh, in a more detailed manner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, daily I can go through them uh, really fast, but on weekly, I really want to, uh, go more deep to actually, you know, maybe I, I haven't seen something more clearly, maybe, you know, a stock. Uh, I, I moved from, uh, I didn't include a stock, but it was in a really good theme, even though it's not showing, you know, it's not that linear, um, you know. So what I will do is I will run these scans, you know, uh, more deeply and I will enhance my bulk list. I will do just, you know, throw the weeds and keep the flowers in my bulk list. So mm -hmm. I will just, you know, throw the names that are not looking anymore, uh, not looking good anymore. Maybe they have broken down. Uh, you know, not respecting the, their average, moving averages. And um, one other thing that I will do is, there are many stocks on my bulk list that I, I wouldn't, uh, that I, I haven't uh, researched the numbers. Uh, so I will, you know, just include the numbers um, in here, the earnings acceleration, the sales, um, you know, maybe a new, uh, some news that I, I, did, I wasn't able, able to capture. Um, within the week, I will include them as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what uh, I, I will also do on the weekends is um, I will go through back to my, my, my what's my focus list, right? That I keep up from every single day. And I will try to, to kind of see what happened. I mean, the stock that I had, because I really have a, a memory of a goldfish. I don't remember anything. <laughs> so, yeah. So I will just, you know, open from Monday. What, what happened? What stocks did they have here? What, what happened? Did they break out? Did they have a follow through? Did they, right. um, you know, uh, uh, and I do that for the whole week. And basically, I have I can gain some clues based on this um, going through the back uh, focus list because usually, you know, we talked we talked about breakouts, and if you study stock market history, you're gonna see that breakouts uh, happen in clusters, right? So when you the, the the market is favorable, the you're gonna get many many breakouts. And um, so by going back to my watch list, if the watch list, you know, is limited with a small uh, amount of number of stocks for many days, or uh, I see that many of the stocks that I had on watch list didn't even trigger and broke down, or I have the feedback from my own trades that I get stopped out or, uh, you know, I, I, I give many attempts and I, I, I fail and I get stopped out. Uh, that's generally when I, I withdraw. I became I become more conservative. So mm -hmm. keeping back watch list is a good habit. Um, not all, not to have a, uh, not because I have a, an OCD, right? But because I, I really like to make it easy for myself to train, to prepare, mm -hmm. to understand, and be in sync with the market. Um, yeah. So if, uh, even this year and uh, the years prior, I was able to spot you know kind of the market shifts uh, through you know through maybe you know. A sudden pullback or a general shift in the trend by kind of looking to my uh, back watch list. So that's something that I also do. And the other thing, just to finish my weekly routine is um, I will just, you know, put a lot of names on these stocks to study for a specific month. So mm -hmm. after a month ends, I will usually go back to this list and I will try, you know, to take some screenshots, maybe, you know, some news, something that I, I have taken or something that I haven't. And try to have a good bookkeeping. So that's about my weekly routine. It's more, it's more of a bookkeeping process and a training and training and preparing. Yeah, that's great. And though those big, mo uh, those, uh, those watch lists for each month, um, are they mostly stocks that made really big moves? What, what kind of types of stocks do you like to put on that list to, to study further? Yeah. So these are, uh, I can open up, you know, some screens. So these are, you know, uh, stocks that generally move uh, good within uh, a certain period and maybe you know I have taken you know, or I have missed it but I really want to see so there are, there are basically stocks that fulfill my criteria to enter mm -hmm. right so maybe there was a really cool breakout or you know there was an episodic pivot or there's a parabolic short or all the other branches that uh, within these setups so mm -hmm. it's kind of fulfilling my criteria or, or it might be small you know diversified to my criteria but I still want to look it because I may discover something new right. about my process right, right. so maybe 
for example, I told you there are many stocks that were gapping up after beating uh, were beaten down uh, for a whole year, right? So, uh, yeah. So I was putting these stocks um, in my watch list. So after you know on my weekly routine, and I, I was opening these stocks, and I was seeing you, you know, man, there are many stocks that are you know in the phase one with a lot of volume and they are gapping up. So I was able to find this. Uh, kind of move to be able to adapt to it and take it, which is a branch, you know, diversification of the breakouts. Right. Because usually, you know, you want the breakouts on phase two, uh, on the most, you know, like uh, institutional names. Uh, but there are many, you know, stocks that uh, gave a hundred or two hundred percent move from the bottom. Yeah, uh, and they were fast. Uh, that I was able to find through, you know, this this keeping these stocks to study. So I, I'm keeping keeping ideas that are close to the setups that I take. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, that's that's that's, that's uh, what the watch list are about. Yeah, I love that. Basically building a model book of, of different months and different yeah, themes exactly. and different setups. No, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to kind of dive into this past year. And uh, if you wouldn't mind kind of talking about how you traded the overall year, maybe share some different trades from different periods. Uh, I think that would that would help uh, with a lot of people watching. And I, I think they'd find that a pretty interesting, you know, when were you really aggressive? When were you kind of taking the the gas off the foot pedal? Um, all of that, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's start it from, from the start, right? From January. Um, and let me put, you know, my execution screen so you have a better view of... Um, do you, do you see my screen? Yep. It's perfect. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's start from January, right? So uh, basically what what was happening in January, we hadn't yet escaped. Um, the market was moving down, right, rapidly. And it was the first, you know, kind of higher lows that we have printed late December, right, going into January. So uh, I was still, you know, bearish uh, at this point. But I what I was looking is I always on this bear market, I was trying to look for stocks that were showing, you know, a big relative strength and there are momentum leaders. Uh, so there was showing an extreme amount of relative strength compared to the market. Mm -hmm. And also at this period, you know, we had the China that started from November on December. So if you look at uh, T-Web, you can see that China started, you know, showing an extreme relative strength to the overall, you know, US market, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the month leading to 2023. So I was looking a lot of these China names and uh, also, I was trying to look, you know, specifically at names that, as I told you, so a big relative strength. And why you need to focus on these names, guys, within, uh, if you're in the bear market, let's say, or, if you know, even of an, in a small, you know, bear trend uh, within an uptrend market is, you know, let's say, imagine three people, the one is, everyone is holding a stone above them, right? There, there are many people have said many examples, but I'll just give my own. So, yeah, all the people are holding a stone above their head. The one is sitting on concrete, the other one is on mud, and the other one is on water, right? So the the person that is standing on concrete, he's not gonna, uh, he's gonna stand stand his ground still. The one he's on mud, he's gonna bury his feet and legs, and the one he's on water, he's gonna probably drown. So if we get off that stone, the one who is on concrete, he's gonna probably run really fast to its destination right away, right? Because the pressure, uh, there's no pressure. The one who's on mud. He's gonna take some time to, you know, to unbury his feet and legs, and then maybe run. And the one who's on water, you know, he's gonna need. Uh, maybe he's gonna never recover. He's dead already. So right, yeah. yeah. So many times they're he, they're gonna not recover, and we've seen that many uh, with many names in 2020. Yeah. Right. They didn't recover, but you know there are many turnaround situations that you can have. You know, a restructure of the model of the business and uh, all these things. So there is a help. A submarine that comes down and brings you to the surface. So, you know, I really want to focus though to, to the stocks that show er, er, extreme relative strength. Stocks like, you know, SMCI back in January. Mm -hmm. You know, this stock, even though the market was going down, this stock was was looking really angry. Even though it wasn't that linear, you know, it wasn't that linear because there's uh, uh, you know big uh, up and downs. It was showing an extreme relative strength. And stocks like, you know, CVV, you know, it wasn't going down. It was, you know, going up. It was printing higher lows and, and it was sitting up. And stocks like, you know, SYM, and I, I can uh, get into details, right? Going into January, the market was going down, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, I mean, January, you know, the market uh, was going up, but prior to, I mean, December, you know, uh, going into January, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. uh, these things were, were holding strength. So that's what I'm trying to focus on. So you know what happened to this SMCI stock, you know, when the pressure uh, was not there anymore, right? We've seen that move. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I was really focused on, on, on these names. I, I was focused on China names that were showing strength. And I was looking at this SMCI, uh, CVV and uh, SYM. So I can get into details of how I traded this stuff. Um, yeah, for, first, actually, let me stop you there, because right, I think this might be help, helpful for, for overall context. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of your kind of trading statistics, your, your batting average, your average gain, average loss, you know, uh, throughout throughout 2023? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my win rate is really small. So for this year, my win rate is kind of better than the previous. So this year, it was like 33 or 34% win rate mm -hmm. but it fluctuated i mean there were periods that it could drop back to 25 percent and there are periods like on june or july where uh, my win rate was nearly to 40 percent okay mm -hmm. so yeah it really fluctuates but the average is you know 32 percent and my system is really you know focused on asymmetric returns mm -hmm. uh, so one trade can make me you know 10 20 30 on the extreme 70 80 hours on the full uh, full extremes right but the average is like you know, five to one, maybe on average. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's focused on asymmetric returns. And I really wanna, uh, wanted to achieve that when I was shifting from day trading to swing trading. Right. So I, what I wanted to do is, you know, I wanted to build my system to tolerate maximum pain. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have a really small, you know, average risk per trade as well. So my risk per trade is... Um, 0 0.25 to 0 0.4 percent of my account mm -hmm. and that may sound small to many people but you know i can explain you why i ended up using this risk if, if you're interested um uh, yeah please so yeah uh so basically back when i was day trading i was risking one percent or even more in a single trade um uh, so when i started you know shifting into swing trading i saw that if i wanted to risk one percent with my really really tight stops i would you know end up having uh, a 50 or 60 percent position uh, on a single name so i i wanted to limit and i still do today my positions to max 30 or max 25 percent position so by default so the first reason you know i decrease my risk is kind of, is pure mathematical so by default i had to drop that risk to to half right because most of the times with half percent of risk i could you know with really tight stops because if you have the, your stop at the last contraction point of the VCP, it's not going to hurt you. But with tight stops, you have this problem with position sizing. Uh, so I dropped my risk to, to half percent. And then the other reason that I'm using this kind of small risk is more sophisticated. So, you know, if you can see right here, uh, basically what, what's showing this, this, what this chart is showing is, you know, based on your win rate, you can have, you know, 30, 35, 40, or even more. Based on your win rate, what's going to be the probability of having consecutive loses one after the other, right, within a 50 trade period? And for me, 50 trades were even one month or one month and a half. And, uh, uh, you know, I was checking, like, if when I had, you know, because I was getting feedback even when I was shifting that my win rate is small. So when I had, you know, 35% or 30% win rate, I could see that within a month period, right, there is a 70% chance that I'm going to get 10 trades wrong one after the other. Right. So if I risk 1%, that means that every single month, if I do the things normally, right, that, that is integrated within the system and operating at your best self, generally, right? So it would be normal for me if I risk 1% to lose 10% of my account. Mm -hmm. So that didn't make sense. And that, that was the reason that I wanted to change because I didn't want to have that in my life, right? And... Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I decrease my risk to half, right? But still on half, if you if there's a 70% chance, and this is the normal that I can have, you know, 10 consecutive uh, loses, I could lose 6 or 7 or 8% of my account, and I, I, losses work geometrically against you. I mean, everyone knows it, right? So if you get beyond 10%, you need to make 11% back to, to, to just to break even. And uh, if you have bigger drawdowns, this is going to get even harder to dig out of the hole. 
So I knew that beforehand, and I really didn't want to have these emotional swings and traumatic experience from mm-hmm. having a big drawdown just by the normal behavior of my strategy in the market. So, yeah, this, you know, this, this doesn't include, you know, uh, being, um, you know, being sick or being heartbroken or, or not being in sync with the market right. or, you know, having uh, some self-destructive so- uh, thoughts within one or two days or having a big sleep ads or having a fatty finger mistakes. So the half percent wasn't even viable again. So I said, you know, I'm going to drop it even more. So that's how I ended up with a risk of 0.25 to uh, 0.4. And I can get to 0.5 or 0.6 where the market is favorable and I have many safe positions. But generally, I want to keep the risk uh, small because I really don't want to have any traumatic experience. And I want to build, I build my, my foundation in, in, in order to tolerate maximum pain. Yeah. So I can be heartbroken, I can be drunk, I can be, you know, out of sync with the market, I can have 10, 10 trades wrong, and it still wouldn't hurt me, I will lose, you know, 3% of my account, and I can make all this back in a single trade. Right. So that was my approach, into, I wanted really to build my system to tolerate maximum, maximum pain, all right, so we can get back, um, yeah, so my batting average, you know, I told you my win rate is around 30%, and uh, I'm really focused on asymmetric returns, and my loss is real. Uh, sorry, my my risk is really small, and you know, you can make big gains with risking uh, really small mm-hmm. amounts of capital uh, per per trade. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of my statistics. Do you have you know any other statistics? Yeah, that you- just following up. So you've given us kind of the the reward to to risk uh, the ratio there. What what is kind of on average your average loss on on a position? I guess you know in terms of looking at the chart and percentage wise, uh, do you have a sense of that? I mean, your stops stops low of the day. That's that's pretty tight. Yeah. So my stop at the uh, do you do you mean when I enter a stock within the day what happens or or generally? No, just if you've looked at your stats and and have a sense of what your average loss is. Just no, just I general, haven't. Yeah. I haven't actually uh, went so deep uh, on my on my stats, and I don't think you know the stats are are, are the best uh, solution out there because of course you know there are many things that uh, um, uh, you can put your stats and you can see your expectancy and all this stuff, but. Remember that maybe on, on one period, um, I might, you know, um, the stats are going to say the same, what's your average uh, average win, what's your average loss. But on one period, I may risk, you know, one third uh, of what another period might uh, might ha- I have risked as well. So that's not going to show up on the statistics, right. uh, on the average statistics. And the numbers are completely different on the equity curve. So I don't go that deep into the statistic aspect of things. Uh but we can do, talk about, you will see that when we uh, talk, to, uh, talk about the trades and how I handled them, uh, we can actually all see how, um, you know, because I move my stops to break even. So, uh, you know, it might not end up in a loss and uh, uh, I may take some partials on strength and then on weakness. So right. you, you will, you know, you will uh, see uh, that even, you know, if I, even if I have tight stops, uh, there are many, many times that the stock, you know, moves on my direction. I move my stock to break even, so nothing is lost. Right. And yeah, I, uh, to be honest, I really have even on intraday to to try many different times to enter on a stock. It might stop me one time or two times, and there are many times to to that, you know, I even lose a stock because it hit hit my stop, and then, uh, you know, I wasn't able to get back in, and I completely lose it. Uh, but this is the sacrifice I make uh, in order to be, you know. Uh, really relaxed and have these asymmetric returns and uh, um, uh, you know and follow my style and yeah so we will go through the trades and you, we can see you know this uh, more deep statistics through our tr- through my trades yeah if sounds that's good. okay yeah let's do it all right so yeah I started uh, talking about you know January so I was focused a lot on of, in China names and uh, uh, basically what I did was uh, I, I went long at the early days of January on this, you know, CVV uh, ticker symbol. So this thing had escaped, you know, from a prior uh, big range and then it was on high ground and it was, you know, I could see the volume that is popping up and it's the uh, biggest volume within a really big uh, period. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this move, this stock has moved, you know, 50% up and uh, it was going sideways. And what I'm, I'm trying to do is, you know, uh, this is the exact thing that I'm trying to spot. Uh, big move up, followed by, you know, 
uh, a period of consolidation and then the trailing moving average. So if it's a high tide flag, I'm going to trail the 10 moving average, right? If it's a, a slower moving name uh, that is not specifically theme related or really, really fast, I'm going to trail the 20 uh, moving average. So this is, you know, a high tide flag. So I went long uh, when it broke out of this range mm -hmm. right here, right? Through that high or kind of through that uh, the trend line that, that you drew there? Yeah, so as I told you, I put, you know, uh, so, so I put my my alert when I, where I think the core of the move is. So for right. this exact uh, uh, ticker, when, we, when I have an inside day, this is, you know, the maximum tightness that you can get when you get yeah. an inside day, right? So I put, I generally put this trend line exactly above the inside day. So as long, uh, when it triggered, I went, this stock long and I put my stop at the low of the day, right? Um, so what happens after after I, I initiate a trade is, you know, I don't necessarily sell just because the stock have moved, have moved 15 or 20% up. So I treat each stock differently differently because it is different. So, you know, a 20% move in NVIDIA is totally different than a 20% move in this stock, right? right. So I, I really use this ADR. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is, when I get a move in, a, in my direction, uh, and I check the ADR before the breakout day, right? So the ADR, you can see that in that window uh, on the left side was around 6%, right? If you can see that in the, the window that pops up yeah. on the left yeah. side. Yeah. So it's around 6%. So that means the stock is moving around 6% in a single day. So my first partial would uh, will be around a 2.5 to 3 ADR multiples, right? So for this specific stock, this thing moved in a single day around 20%. So I took a partial. I took one third, uh, one fourth off. Uh, usually I take one fourth off, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If if it goes uh, two and a half to three multiples. And uh, it not always goes on the first day. It can go, you know, on three, four, five days, this, this distance. Uh, but when I get this distance, I usually take some shares off. And usually... What I will do is, if it's on the first day, right, I will put my stop, uh, I will keep my stop, I will put sub, uh, half of the shares that are left on break even, right, mm -hmm. and the other half I will put them uh, on my, the yeah, on the on the original stop, right? Mm -hmm. So even if it reverses, it's not going to do that much damage because I have already sold the portion and then it's, I'm going to sell another portion on break even, so I might lose, you know, one third of my initial uh, risk, which which is small from uh, from the start, right? Um, yeah, so that's what I do. And some other cases, I will just you know move the stop right away to break even if this happened in a matter of two or three days. Right. Uh, so I can have more time to assess the quality of the breakout. Uh, that means accompanied with volume and seeing the action on the next days and how it reacts to the overall market or you know the general industry that it, uh, this stock was in. So I'm using this example just to, to, to get you through my selling rules and I can be quicker on the next ones. But uh, basically this this stock went, you know, uh, was going up and up and up and it has moved, you know, uh, for days after day after day. And uh, I didn't sell any of it because when I sell, take a, I mean, okay, if I get, you know, seven or eight or 10 uh, ADR multiples, okay, I will share another portion. But uh, on this specifically, I didn't sell because after I sell something to strength, I want to trail the moving averages, right? So um, uh, why I do that is because I've seen many examples from the past that there are many stocks that did the unimaginable. The, you couldn't believe that the stock had went up 200 or 300 percent in this period of time. So I really, you know, want to reward myself selling something to strength, and then mm -hmm. I want to leave to the market. Uh, what what uh, you know to do what uh, it wants to do to the stock. So as I told you, I assess the quality of the breakout, right? So what I want to see is, you know, the, um, basically when the stock is reversing, maybe it's reversing, you know, to the moving averages. Mm -hmm. I, I want to see that when it's, you know, I want to see first respecting, you know, this moving coverage, but maybe it had, uh, maybe let's say it reversed from here, mm -hmm. right? Basically, the bounce, I want it to be quicker uh, with mm -hmm. bigger volume than, um, you know, the pullback. Mm -hmm. So if we have, you know, two, two or three days within a pullback, I want it in, in three or four days to be able to, to, to snap back uh, into high grounds. 
So yeah, on this specific stock, uh, I basically cut a lot of my shares on this, you know, day right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was scared and I think I cut a lot of this day. And then uh, I went completely out here, mm -hmm. right? So I, I abandoned my core rules because after the first close on the 10 moving coverage, I usually wait for the 20 if I have a lot of cash in, uh, right? And, and yeah. on this one, I didn't respect my rules. So I ended up selling a little bit early. And of course, it gave another uh, leg up, a quick leg up. I mean, I could sell, you know, at a higher uh, price and uh, have more profits. So this one was one of my setups. And another one was uh, SMCI, right? And let me boot that screen so you can see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the yeah, my entries. And uh, yeah, I basically went, uh, tried to went long on this thing, uh, on this specific day, and I got stopped out, right? Mm -hmm. So again, you, you, you're you going to have many stocks that you're going to be stopped out. Uh, even though this strong looked really good and it was showing relative strength, it wasn't ready yet. It was it, it needed some time to burn. So I'm not gonna get mad at it. I'm just gonna you know wait for it. And uh, as I told you, I was also you know watching this SYM um, uh, trade right here. So I think this one. Uh, uh, let's see. No, 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 this one I took l later on. So sorry. Uh, yeah, but I was looking a lot of China names, right? Yeah. So. China uh, had uh, moved up from October up until January, and I went long on this MNSO right here, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, a really clean break. You have a stock that was beaten down. It's a fresh stock. It's two years in the market. Uh, you kind of see the footprints, you know, before mm -hmm. uh, beforehand, and uh, it's escaping this, uh, these long raids and mm -hmm. this trend line from the past, and it's showing some momentum, and the China is also looking good, so what I did is I went long on this specific day right here. And uh, again, I followed the same principles, like two and a half move up. I sell the portion or 3% of the ADR. I sell a portion, then I leave the rest to trail to the moving averages. I really want to see them respecting this and be linear mm -hmm. with the moving averages if it's a momentum leader. And you can see the, the spot the, here, like two days down, one day up right. uh, into high grounds, right? So you can see that. Uh, into the action, but I went out of this. Um, I think on this day because you know, again, I you know, I don't always follow my, my selling rules, so you know, I shouldn't go out of this stock because it scared me because it has went up down yeah. right here and I was close to break even. So mm -hmm. I said, you know, I'm just gonna close it, but if I waited a little bit, I would have been, you know, uh, at the same spot where I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so I took this MNSO trade as well, and um, you know I have bought. I, I also bought this Dada mm -hmm. uh, ticker. It's the same concept, right? Beaten down name, and I found these names with my dense volume scan. So beaten down name, uh, and some of course with the other scans, but uh, uh, beaten down name showing some momentum. Uh, it builds a flag right here. You know the the momentum averages. The you know the the moving coverage is cuts up, and then you have a breakout of, out of the range, and I entered this stock right here. So again, it's the same concept. Like, you know, you, you just wait to see uh, the quality of the breakout, and uh, you know, if you get a really, really great risk to reward, of course, you're gonna take another partial, of course, uh, at the at the move up. Uh, but then again, you know, I followed uh, my selling rules, so I took, I sold uh, some portion here, and I sold. Uh, mm -hmm. some portion here and there were many many trades back in january that i got stopped right richard so yeah i tried this tsll so i, I went long on this day right here and i got stopped out right here mm -hmm. and uh, i also you know tried this iq so i went long on this day right here and i got stopped out on this day right here not it was really close you know but i, I just closed it i would i shouldn't have closed it but i just closed it so this is you know the sacrifice that you take uh, when you have really tight stops, I mean, if I had my stop around here, I wouldn't, I would, be, I would be in on this trade, right? Um, yeah, so that's how January went. So I had, you know, some good trades, uh, but I joined really late on the competition. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you you join late, you 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 start counting your results from the day you entered. So I entered on twenty third, I think, of January. So it was, you know, the the seventh month, uh, seven day period that resulted for my January performance. And then getting to February. Oh, can I can I pause you real quick? Because yeah, I've, yeah. I've got some questions. Um, specifically about uh, when you're buying through your your key line, 
are you really focused on the daily chart or are you also looking at you know intraday patterns to try to you know manage risk tighter that way or or, or potentially just focused on that daily yeah so that's a great question because i forgot to mention it uh, so yeah I, I basically look at the daily chart so when i get an alert i know you know it's okay for me to buy but uh, what i would also check is you know if it's uh, if the distance of my stop uh, from the low of the day is you know bigger than one atr so this yeah. number right here right it's it's not tight for me anymore so i try to take you know uh stocks that you know went above the range but are you know within this uh atr uh range and of course i will look at uh, i look at intraday charts like i told you i have here the one minute and the five minute chart and the reason that i have them is for the um for the cases and this happens more on um uh, episodic pivots but it, it happens on, on breakouts a lot of times as well is you know the the stock might went out of the range then trigger so you enter on the stock and then it can go and take you know the low of the days uh as well right so what how I enter on stock is on stocks is usually you know on the you know five minute opening rates breakouts uh that also take you know the range uh sometimes you know I can I, because I have the stock on my focus list. I can enter of some sort of anticipation, mm -hmm. right? So I might, might take you know the five minute opening rates breakout, and then you know after the next five minutes it breaks the it breaks the range. So yeah, sometimes I enter of anticipation, uh, but I really like to look uh, at the intraday chart uh, for the purposes uh, for you know the 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 cases that the stock takes out uh, the low of the day. So uh, if the stock takes out the low of the day uh, after it has broke, if it's anticipation, I don't mind, I might retry, right? Mm -hmm. But if it has already broken through its range and then it takes the low of the day, I'm always going to enter the stock if it goes again above VWAP and kind of consolidates above VWAP. So this is a, kind, a sign of strength for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I will take this trade after it consolidates a bit uh, around VWAP, so I will take after this consolidation on, on VWAP on the five minute, and I will put my stop at the low uh, of the day, or I will just use two stops: one at the, you know, this basic little pattern that is forming on VWAP, and one uh, other shares at the low of the day. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I look at intraday charts as well, right? And I also look at the hourly, but yeah, I'm, I'm more focused on the first two hours of uh, the open, so I'm more focused on the one and five minute uh, charts. Mm -hmm. No, that's helpful. No, that, that, that's good. That's exactly what I was curious about. So yeah, perfect. L let's keep diving into to February, I guess. Yeah, so I, I will get it, I'll go more quick from here, right? So no, uh, go, at your, go at your pace, whatever whatever you want to go at. I'm sure <laughs> okay, nobody, okay. nobody's complaining, I'm sure, if you go All into right. more detail, so. Yeah, so um, my, my risk was uh, getting into February, uh, my risk was still small, right? So I was risking allowed, uh, around 0 0.2 or, uh, you know, 0.25% of my account per trade uh, because I wasn't still convinced, uh, you know, about the, the whole market and if we're going to get a, a, a big leg up. Uh, yeah, so getting into February, uh, I, I, I've also, you know, I forgot to mention CVNA. Yeah, I told you when we first... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I bought this stock uh, on this... Um, they right here. So this, you know, uh, lasted until, you know, the early days of February. Um, but I was uh, quick to sell the stock when it reached this moving coverage right here, this declining, because usually, you know, these names, they're going to, when Run they haven't, them. you know, moved for long, yeah, they're going to reach a declining moving coverage, and then they might reverse really hard. So I closed most of the shares at this day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the other ones are closed on this, you know, uh, when it closed below that 10 moving coverage. And, you know, I was waiting for it to on February to take it again, but it broke down. So, you know, it never triggered. Mm -hmm. um, so on February, you know, I made a big return. And that return was um, because of, of Lunar. So uh, as you can see, you know, how can I say it? You know, I also took, you know, HIMS. On this, on on uh, you know, late February, and it failed, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, an earnings, uh, you know, uh, catalyst, and the stock failed three days later. So, what I want to say here is, there there are gonna be trades that are gonna be really sophisticated, that you have really done your analysis and you know the numbers and the story, and uh, 
they're showing great strength and they are leaner and they are looking perfect and they're just gonna fail. And then yeah. there are trades that they just pop into your scans, uh, you know, one day before or you know pre-market, and they do, they just do something unexpected. So that happened with Lunar. So this thing, you know, um, printed a really big day up uh, on this day right here and popped into my momentum continuation scans that I was using, as I told you. You know, I'm searching for stocks that have a big green day with a big volume relative to the overall market. So, yeah, I was just seeing the stock, you know, having an inside day and an inside day on the on the hourly. It was looking at that, uh, like a, a great breakout, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I entered on this day right here and this stock literally moved up like three three hundred percent. Wow! So I made um, within the day, I made like twenty or or twenty five percent of my account with a minimal position. Like I had, don't know, maybe twenty percent of my of wow. my account on this stock, uh, and I made you know uh, like all this twenty percent back because of course I was selling you know uh, a lot of parcels because I, it it made the move that I wanted to make for a month uh, within a, a day. day. Yeah. Yeah. So I was selling a lot on this name and uh, I basically made 20% or, or more in a single day. So they're gonna, every year there are going to be trades that they are really sophisticated. Some that are going to work and some they don't. And, and then there are some random trades that are going to, you know, affect your, your equity curve that much. And they, they just, you know, happen out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the reason I take no days off. I mean, there are going to be days that I'm not going to be that active. But I always want to see what's moving. Because if I hadn't taken this lunar trade back on February, right, my equity curve and the compounding would be far different uh, for the rest of the year. So, yeah, lunar uh, was a great, it was the best trade that I had on February. And, um, uh, you know, I also had this. Uh, so, uh, please interrupt me if you have questions, Richard. Uh, when mm -hmm. I'm speaking, please, uh, you know, uh, go ahead and interrupt me. And I also, you know, took this uh, Amam trade, uh, this ticker. So again, it's the same concept, a beaten down name. So at the end, at the start of the year, you all you the best looking setups were looking like this. Yeah. Right. So again, you know, it, it broke out of the range. I didn't buy it on this day uh, because I had missed it, and then it printed an inside day. So I really like that it hold it. Uh, right here and and this is also tight right mm -hmm. this is a, a tight point above you know the it's hold, it holds above the range with volume so i gave it a go on this day and i had my stop at the low of the day uh, and it never you know went back and it worked beautifully so again after three adr i will take a I took a partial and then you know i dragged this trade into march right uh, so basically it was you know around uh, late february so you know this uh, trade lasted until March uh, and I went, you know, I, I, of course I took, on this day I took a lot of Sarah's off. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason is it kind of fulfilled my criteria for a parab parabolic short. Mm. That's the reason I took the Sarah's off. Um, uh, yeah, and, and then I closed, you know, the rest on this day and I closed the rest on this day. Uh, <clears throat> right? And then, you know, the stock uh, you know, worked again. But we will first. Let's talk about March. Mm -hmm. uh, so March. Let's let's remember. Just remember what the spy was doing. Yeah. Um, so getting into Feb, uh, early March, you know the the whole thing with the banks uh, started happening. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I really thought um, that this is gonna uh, create a domino effect or something uh, in the market, and uh, I, I really, you know, kept my 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 risk again small at least at the, at the early and uh, I was really scared to put uh, a lot of trades on March uh, due to this fact but um, you know I, I cut some uh, uh, I was able to cut some great trades like you know early March this uh, dual which was you know um, an episodic pivot as you want to say it right uh, so uh, that was also you know an AI related stock but I don't remember if on March we had the AI theme I don't yeah, quite remember. We, we might have because I think the AI, the AI stock itself, I think was making some crazy run to begin yeah. the year. So I, th I think the theme was. was oh, in play. that's why yeah. I forgot. Yeah, 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 that's what. So I went long on this, you know, AI, and I got stopped right away. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and I, yeah, let's see if I have. Yeah, I have it. I have the AI long on on this on this day. But yeah, so basically, I was able to catch, you know, this uh, dual 
which also was a, a, AI related. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have it also on my, you know, my, my summary. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for, I, again, for this one, would, would you mind kind of covering your entry tactic for this one? Just because we haven't talked about that yet for, for yeah. Uh, so for, for, so for the, Peter. yeah, yeah, great. Right, sure. For the episodic pivots, what I'm trying to do is take either the one minute opening rates high or the five minute opening rates high. And then it's the same concept. If it yeah. breaks uh, the low, I might g give it another um, try when it, if it goes around VWAP, start mm -hmm. printing some higher lows around VWAP, and then I'm going to buy above VWAP. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the same concept, even on breakouts or on this episode of Pivots. And these are trades that I had from my past trading, uh, the trading days, right? That I kept. And uh, yeah, if it if it's more than uh, two or three, uh, more than three times that I try an entry, I'm just going to abandon it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to you know, uh, more than three times, I just forget about the stock. Um, and uh, if we want to go a little bit deeper, so um, if uh, if this if uh, m more necessarily on biotech, so I've seen from studying the past that there are many biotech companies uh, that close on the you know catalyst day they close red. Uh, so on this on the on the biotechs, I will try. Uh, I will be more keen to buy on the second day. Gotcha. Because that's generally what uh, I have seen that they, they work really great on the second day. Mm. And so if it stops me out on the first day and I miss it, I'm not going to retry on the second day. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait for it to kind of become a, a high tide flag or a breakout setup. So yeah. that the, I will wait for the moving coverage to, to catch up. And then, you know, I would if I miss this duel, I would retry here. And I actually add it here mm -hmm. on this setup. So uh, I would try here, right? Right away. And it worked just fine, right? I mean, th I think, yeah, it didn't stop me. Uh, so, yeah, on this talk, I entered on the... Did I cover you? Did, uh, or... Yeah, no, th that's... I think that's exactly what I was looking for. And uh, this is a kind of an unrelated question, but I, I just remembered I, I wanted to ask you this, but um, how did you use... How do you use typically margin, if at all, in your system? Is it only during the best periods? Do you do you always kind of look uh, look to be on margin, or how do you kind of use um, that, it, if at all, during your during your process? Yeah, so for all the year, I literally use no margin. Mm -hmm. I mean, no overnight margin. I use mm -hmm. some kind of uh, you know intraday margin because I had some swing trades and I need I opened up some day trades, so I used a lot of intraday margin, but overnight margin. I did. I didn't use it so, because mm -hmm. I think you know, and many people have said that uh, margin is something you need to earn. Yep. It's not like you are uh, underexposed or in the market, like three, thirty or forty or fifty percent exposed in the market, and uh, you just went to to be one hundred and fifty or two hundred percent, you know, exposed in the market. Because uh, what I do is when I wanna when I have full positions, you know, and I wanna go into margin. So I used it, but I, I, I went into 110, 115, or 120% because I will tell you the reasons why I was, wasn't able to use margin. It's within my rules. So when I, I, I really feel like, like I need to use margin, and usually this happens in favorable periods because on, on bad periods, I will try to progressive exposure, expose myself and test the water. So, so I let you know my trade finance my next trade so I, I don't open you know six trades in one day because just because they broke out i will wait even if i lose some opportunities just to test the water so i only have this issue with the margin when when it's a favorable period mm -hmm. uh, so for me what happens is when i need to use the margin the first time thing i check is you know i check my at my positions do all the names that i hold are you know the best names out there or the this thing that i want to buy you know, maybe uh, is this something on my portfolio really slow? Do I need to take some partials uh, on any, you know, of my of my stocks that I, I own? If something is really slow and it's taking a lot of my position, you know, stocks like with three ADR, yeah. let's say, right? Maybe I need to, to, to close some of the shares because my risk wouldn't be big as well on this kind of stocks with a really tight stop uh, in order to open a position. So first I check my positions. To see if I need to take peel some shares off, so that's the first thing I do. The second thing uh, that I'm trying to do is, you know, to have a lot of positions in the safe zone. So if I have many positions that I have a lot of open risk, let's say, if I have a lot of open risk and many trades are, you know, I have my stop at the original uh, 
uh, place that I had I have it and I have you know maybe three four five percent this rarely happens but let's say I have a two or three percent open risk I'm not gonna go into margin mm-hmm. I'm just gonna wait to, to make some of the position safe maybe move, move my stock to break even maybe you know take some partial soft to reward myself and then I might open up some margin so gotcha. uh, yeah literally maybe you know uh, uh, I didn't do good but <laughs> Uh, and I missed many opportunities and I did many, many mistakes, but I didn't, uh, my rules didn't allow myself to go into a big margin. That's, right. that's the reality of it. Right. No, that's helpful. And, and um, in an ideal world, how many positions do you like to have at any one time? Is it, you know, is it under 10? Um, you, you know, how, how do you like to split up your portfolio typically uh, during a, during a good trading period? Yeah, so my average position is around, you know, uh, 13 to 15 to 16%. Yeah, that's kind of my average position. So I can open up like seven or eight positions at the same time. But when I, you know, I, I make a position save and I, uh, I I peel off some shares, then I have, you know, and I have some profit cash and then I can use it right. uh, in order to open some uh, new positions, right? So uh, I really want to keep it below 13 or 14 or 15 positions because then, it's hard for me to kind of shift uh, through different things. I, I kind of, you know, uh, feeling lost of some days or feeling uh, totally mentally drained. Right. And what I figured out from having many positions, and I think there are many people that have many, many positions. It's just, I can't, I can't do it. Uh, is what I discovered is when I have a lot of positions and something bad happens, maybe I'm, I'm going to react on emotional burst mm. on many of these positions uh, so when you have many positions, chances are some of them are going to do bad, right? Uh, so if you have five, maybe one is doing bad. But if you have 15, maybe three or four are doing bad right. or, you know, scare you within the day. So what happened is when I, I have, you know, that many positions, I'm more vulnerable, not necessarily that I'll do it, but I may be scared and cut, you know, more shares of, of some things and act on some sort of emotional burst without, you know, doing any damage seriously to my account. But you know, I minimize my profit. So I really want to keep it below 15. Yeah, makes makes perfect sense. And uh, sorry for these these outside questions compared to what you were focused no, it's on. Great. But, I mean, but it's good. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So um, I'll let you get back uh, to, to March, I believe. Yeah, it was March. So I was able to get, you know, this dual name and uh, uh, it was AI, AI, AI related. So the, the theme started, you know, uh, emerging and... Uh, I told you, you know, I, I went long on this specific day. I had my stop at the low of the day. And then, you know, I took some shares off on this day. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, my mistake, but I, I, I was able to put them back in mm-hmm. on this breakout day. So I would normally take this setup uh, on this day, even if I went, I didn't went long on this day, right? Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to do when I add is, you know, I'm not going to build a position of 35 or 40 percent. So I'm going still going to keep my position uh uh, small within you know 30 percent uh, if it's a good position but i'm trying to free roll my ads right so when i add i'm trying to for my stop loss my new stop loss for the all the shares to be above what my average price of you know the first entry and the, and the ad is right so for example if i entered here uh, let's say with uh, uh, you know all the shares and i take one third off right here and i, I put another third off here, right? My average is going to be somewhere around here, mm-hmm. right? So this is a free rollout because my stop loss for all the shares is going to be, you know, maybe at this point, which is the last, you know, VCP, some VCP uh, contraction point. Right. So I'm trying to blend, you know, all these details when I'm adding, uh, but I always do free rollouts, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I add, added on this thing and, and it really worked great. I mean, it was one of, uh, you know, the best trades that I had. And uh, it went up how much, like, from this, maybe my average was here. Yeah, it went 30% up, so maybe had, like, 30% position. That's a quick, you know, 8 or 9%. And I went out of this, you know, I remember when it broke, this days right here, going into April, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I sold, you know, I sold here again. Uh, because I really, I really like, uh, I, I really liked it. You know, I told you pullbacks to be, you know, kind of in small range and then, you know, um, one day up. Yeah. One day one day up. up. So I, I didn't think that this thing is going to break that easily. It really respected the moving averages. 
but yeah, then it broke, you know? Right. Um, yeah, so Duol was one of uh, my good trades on uh, uh, on March, and then I had, you know, this CDIO. Ah, you know, this is a good example of, you know, the episodic pivots on the second day on, on biotechs, mm. right? So you get a catalyst on this thing right here, which is, you know, it's a, it's a random name, right? But you get a catalyst and you get an, an extreme amount of volume right here. And it just has a red day. So mm-hmm. what I have discovered from doing, you know, deep dives on these biotechs is they work really good on the second day. So I treat the second day like it's the first day of a catalyst gapper. And mm-hmm. I went long on this day right here. And this is, you know, this, it went up 200%. Right, so I had you know maybe on biotechs I don't open positions bigger you know uh, right li- really big positions I try to limit them at ten percent but again this move right here is like ten percent fifteen percent of your account if you hold it um, so I held uh, I, I sold some of my shares because again it it meet with this decline two hundred moving average and I left some and I closed them uh, on these days right here right so yeah I, I took some shares off so I wasn't able to take all this move. Uh, but this is generally what happens with these biotechs. They, they provide really good results. Uh, and I think one other was um, BYX. Uh, uh, yeah, now again, uh, another example, right? Mm-hmm. So this happened on March. Again, you get a catalyst and you get a big move, a uh, big volume, right? Uh, and this stock, if you can see, hasn't done anything. This is the yep. first time that the volume is picking up. Mm-hmm. So I tried on the second day, and again, it worked greatly, right? And I sold most most of my shares on this day because it fulfilled my parabolic short criteria. I didn't went short on this day, uh, but you know, just knowing that you, sometimes the criteria of these parabolic shorts, um, it saves you, yeah, productive. yeah, save you. Uh, basically, can can help you take a big chunk off before the stock reverses twenty percent back down. So right. sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, uh, but I kind of use it, you know. Uh, yeah, so I took most of my shares off on this day and then I, I, I waited and I, I think I went, you know, completely out on this day right here because it was, you know, near my, my break even, uh, near my entry. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as you see, on March, like, not many things were acting, you know, uh, right. Uh, if we look on the index, but, uh, you know, I was able to take some shrink trades uh, that worked really great. And one other trade that I did really... so. Just to remind you, I told you before, we had the bank situation on early March. Yeah. Yeah. So another trade that I took on uh, March was this wall uh, long, right? Mm-hmm. So um, you see that on March, I shift more to day trading uh, like, or uh, really short term swing. And in other months, I'm more like a, a, a blend of swing positional trading. So I'm, I'm really trying to adapt of what's happening or mm-hmm. what the market gives me. So you know, we had the bank situation, and, and I, I've seen the news on the, thir- uh, it was 12, uh, yeah, 12, uh, maybe 12 or 13, I don't know, maybe it's it's th- this day right here. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Fed or the Treasury Department said we're going to basically bail out the banks. So, this is the reverse of a parabolic uh, short setup, it's right? It's a pair about long, st- that's what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, it's a mean reversion. So, you get a mm-hmm. steep decline, and I really want to see the volume footprints. I mean, mm-hmm. we can have a steep decline, but if the volume is not picking up, I'm not going to touch it. And I may have, I may take, you know, one trade in a whole year. Uh, mm-hmm. That looks like it, right? It's not my main setup or anything, but right. I really nailed this whole trade. Uh, I hold it only for this and, you know, I sold on this day, but literally it went up 400%. Right? And I, the bad thing is I had a really, really minimal position on this wall because generally when a, a sector or an industry is really fragile, I tried to take a leverage DTF instead. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it was uh, called the PST. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So most of my position, uh, position sizing size was was on this DPST mm-hmm. but because I want to avoid, you know, any company specific risk. Maybe this wall, uh, you know, company just halted and opened up next day on zero right uh yeah so i basically take this uh when when the the, the industry is fragile i try to take more the leverage dtf to avoid any company specific risk so most of my position was on this dpst 
and it didn't do anything. Yeah. And I had a really, really minimal position just to, you know, uh, to get that adrenaline pump <laughs> on this wall. And this really worked out great, and I wish I had more. Uh, but mm-hmm. again, at this time, I didn't know that, you know, that the Fed is going to, uh, the, the, the program is going to, you know, drive the stocks up or uh, uh, or what's going to happen after that. And I think that announcement is marked the bottom of the, the, the you know, the, the bear market. Mm-hmm. I think it was at this day that the announcement with the, the banks came. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that's it, it was on 13th of March. And after that, you know, the market just went up. So I think that marked the, the bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, not the the bottom uh, of the pro- that, the shorter bottom, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's be. Uh, I'll try to go. You know, uh, more quick. I, I also took this AI. Um, you know, uh, on I basically took it on this day and it failed, and then I retried on uh, this day. So I, t- I I went with a small position size because I. It was more of an anticipation trade right here because it was below, you know, the the, the moving the averages. averages. Yeah. Yeah, and then the official entry was uh, here, so I added more shares right here, uh, and I put my stop because I added here and added here. So my first stop was here and my second here, so I put it right here, right? So I put it on this red day right here on this specific trade. So you know, I kind of experiment on things. It's not, you know, always the same. Right. I have a core, you know, setup and plan and. But, you know, there are many different ways that you can skin a cat, basically. So, uh, but I really, you know, 99% try to stick to my core rules. But, yeah, I took this trade and it worked beautifully for a couple of days. I, I really took, uh, I took, you know, some shares off after, you know, again, uh, this had the 9% ADR. So, you can imagine, like, like in a 30% uh, move, I would take a partial off. So, on this day, I took some shares off. Mm-hmm. And then I got scared on this day and I closed all my position, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I really, I really try. I'm trying to find these themes mm-hmm. because we get a theme every year. This year we 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 took the AI theme and then I really uh, did good with the AI. And I will tell you mostly on May, June, uh, not May. I'll tell you what happened in May, but June and July, you know, I did really good and. Uh, um, we we get this every year. We 2020 the COVID names, 2021 you know some cannabis related names or the the meme stocks, and 2022 the oil stocks. Mm-hmm. And this year we had the AI and the cryptocurrencies, or you know some trades with the bank with the bank related stocks early on March. Or you get a theme every year. So I, I really try to be on top of this theme and uh, and to find all the stocks that are related to this theme and watch them. Um, yeah. Uh, so how, not to drift, how many, you know, the, how many yes. uh, trades on average per per month do you take? And and if if you know your you know how much you took last year, that that might be helpful as well. Yeah, so it's it's enough. Uh, I think it's around two trades per day. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I took around maybe uh, close to five hundred trades this uh, on two thousand twenty three. Mm-hmm. Right. So what's the average? I mean, it's something w- between three two. Or three. Sometimes I might not uh, even take a trade, right? If something doesn't break out, I'm, I'm not. I'm not that. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to have that fix from from over trading. I never had, you know, that uh, that issue. Uh, so yeah, it's around two trades per day. Gotcha. Cool. Um, yeah. So I took this AI and I got stopped and uh, I didn't retry and then we get to April and um, yeah, I'm go- just gonna show you, you know, some some trades that. Um, Worked uh, didn't have some so much follow, so I took this um, go to trade, which was a China related name, and it didn't have much follow. So I took a partial, and then I got you know stopped. And uh, um, also I had you know this FSLY uh, that I also took, and I got stopped out right away. You know that this thing didn't even move. Uh, I went long on this day, which is not you know that tight, but I just you know it looked good, and I went. Uh, I went long and basically closed that trade at break even, right? Mm-hmm. Near to break even. Uh, so there are many, many trades that you're gonna take uh, that are gonna do nothing, right? Yeah. They're gonna stop you out. They're not gonna move. They're not gonna have so much follow through. But it's one or two or three trades or four trades every month, that maybe even less than four, that are gonna do you know something crazy and this will make result. Make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, this will make a difference on your account. 
So of course you can have many trades, but it's usually one or two that are going to do something amazing. So on this world trade, which is, was more of a daily intraday trade, I made a lot of money on on uh, this duol. I made a lot of money, um, and uh, yeah, on March. I remember saying because I really found the difficulty, you know, uh, being in many names. I was I wasn't, uh, you know, fully exposed into the market, and uh, you, because I was still testing the waters, I, I was I didn't even know if the bank situation, you know, I told you before was gonna resolve. Right. And I remember seeing, you know, these big names like Nvidia and uh, and Meta and uh, Google and all these names that were um, not Google, sorry, Meta and Nvidia that uh, you know were holding really strong and had this resilience and i said you know why why i didn't just buy you know put 50 percent of my account into meta and nvidia and i'm just you know trying to find these day trades and uh, um yeah but uh, that's what i would do differently if i i, I did back march i yeah. mean it's these stocks were showing so much resilience and you this uh, uh within this bank situation that everyone got scared these are the stocks, you know, that are uh, considered the most safe because they are big. They're, they move, you know, kind of slower. And these stocks proved to be, you know, really, really great stocks to hold. Mm -hmm. So I would be better on March, even though I made, you know, a big return due to some of these trades like Duol and Wall and all this stuff. But I remember saying many times, like, why didn't I put 50% of my account on NVIDIA or on Meta? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that uh, I remember that from March. And... Uh, Getting into April, April I started, you know, uh, increasing my risk a little bit, and uh, I took, you know, this H I M S trade right here. And you see, uh, it's the same thing all over again. You know, you get a big move, and uh, you get a stock that is respecting the trailing moving average, and it's getting tighter and has, you know, good numbers, and you have the footprints of the volume. It's the same thing. It's getting tight, and then it's break out, breaking out of the range, and you just buy it. You're not near really. It's it's not that hard, you know. The hard thing is to have some sort of a situational awareness. It's not that hard to find these names. Right. Um, yeah. So I went on, long on this thing, and then uh, I took a partial after you know two or three days, and then it stopped me out around break even on this day. And uh, so yeah, I, on April I didn't you know have s so much increase on my account. I went long on this uh, uh, here on this trade on a mom and. Again, I, I got stopped out. I took a partial and then I got stopped out here and here, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what uh, made, you know, April a really good month uh, because I had many losses is, you know, this parabolic short that I took. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a fresh IPO. It has went up uh, 400 and more percent up. It was printing consecutive green days. So uh, I can't get into all my criteria right now. I can't you know, maybe post them on Twitter, or, you know, we can uh, discuss them in another, you know, meetup. And, uh, but uh, what basically I want to see if it's uh, an IPO, I, I basically want to, if it's an IPO and it's uh, the, the market cap is below 1 billion, I want to see them, you know, going up more than 300 or 400%. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I really want to see consecutive green days up and big ranges. And one extra, you know, thing that I really like to see is, after it's, uh, it has surpassed, you know, this percentage move up that I like, on uh, on one day, I want to see, you know, big range and, you know, this volume yep. right here. Do you see uh, that yep. this volume picked up on this day right here? So this is a signal for me if all the other criteria are fulfilled that maybe, you know, the stock has, uh, you know, gave the last, uh, it's out of fuel or, you know, gave, uh, gave all the, the things that it had. So... I'm thinking in Greek right now. That's <laughs> kind of expressed. But yeah, so maybe it, it will exhaust, right? Or, uh, you know, it gave all the gas that it had. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went short on this day right here. And basically on IPOs that, went, that go parabolic, my expectancy, because there is a different expectancy from a stock that, you know, it's on phase, uh, that, you know, is a, a leader uh, and uh, is going through different phases and it's going to the parabolic phase. And it's different with IPOs and it's different with random stocks or uh, different with thin stocks. But generally, when I with IPOs, my expectancy is uh, that this stock can move uh, 35 or more on the downside in a single day or within two or three days. Mm -hmm. So I went short on this day right here. 
and from the prior highs, it has only went up 21%, right? So I held, I don't usually hold stocks overnight on these kind of setups because I've been burned many times, right? I was short and this stock was gapping up at 65 and I was losing 10% of my account. So uh, yeah, um, I don't usually uh, hold some stocks, so I'm going to take a lot of partials, but if it doesn't hit my expectancy, I'm just going to wait for the next day to hit mm-hmm. this expectancy. So mm-hmm. on this day, I then resorted and I added more shares. So I, I was able to catch this, you know, 40% move. Not all of it because I took partials. But imagine, you know, having your a 30 or 40 or 50% of your capital in this stock. Um, this move down can easily make you 7 or 8 or 10% of your, or your money back um, in one or two days. So I think this this trade uh, really saved the month. And again, I'm really pissed. You know, I have I have a, a lot of emotional swings every month. Not big because I learned to channel these emotions. But I remember seeing this CXAI stock in April going up uh, 900% or 800%. And I said, how did I miss it? I mean, I was on top of, you know, the AI theme. I was on top of all these things. How did I miss this stock? Right? So you, you're going to get frustrated a lot. And I, I did get frustrated on, on, on uh, um, you know, on April. And um, that led to an issue on May. Mm-hmm. So what happened on May is um, I basically was first on the competition, right? And I, I literally uh, uh, didn't think about the competition. I mean, I wasn't giving so much attention about the positionings, but that month I let my positioning and rankings get into me because I was first and I said, you know, when we're getting into May and things started working out greatly, I said, if I don't push this month right here, I, I, I'm not going to do good in this competition. Uh, people are going to do great. And I, I was already first, right? So I let kind of my short-term goals uh, determine my actions, kind right. of, right? So it's really... That's that's something that people should pay attention. Don't let don't don't let your short-term goals distract you. And what I mean about short-term goals is, you know, if you are trading just to pay the rent for this month, or if you wanna, you know, uh, do you know, if you have so many obligations and you're trading, this is a short-term goal. This is gonna create so much pressure that you are gonna do some uh, some mistakes, right? Either you're gonna increase your size, you're gonna have you know, fear of missing out, uh, you're going to do, this is a domino effect that escalates. And for me, I didn't have issues, you know, with this stuff, but I, I let the positioning determine my short-term actions on May because I was first and I, I really thought that I, I really need to push this month, thought that I wouldn't even have normally, right? Uh, so I ended up, you know, taking some wrong trades early on, like this IBRX trade, Um Sorry for this. Let me yeah, go no back. Yeah. Um, so I, I tried to short this stock, and this is not even, you know, uh, a textbook setup for me, but I tried right. to short this stock on this day, and this day with big size. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I lost, you know, I didn't lose that much, but I lost, you know, uh, 4 or 5% of my capital in a couple of days. And, you know, uh, I was getting stopped out of some other names uh, that were working great on May, and, uh, or I was missing them. And then I started increasing my size on other names and I was getting stopped out. So that was the first uh, drawdown that I had, which was, you know, around uh, minus seven, minus eight percent. And then mm-hmm. I worked all the other month uh, uh, trying to to kind of, you know, the, do the right things and kind of leave that mentality of, uh, you know, my positioning and running and do the right thing. So I was able, you know, to take some uh, good trades uh, on May. Um, so I took this APLD, um, let me get to May. Yep. No problem. Yeah. So I was able to talk, take this APLD, right? Which was, again, was, um, a breakaway gap or a catalyst gap and it was in the AI related theme, uh, really big volume at this day. So I went long on this thing. Of course, I took a parcel uh, on this day. Uh, I took another partial here, even though it didn't close, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I should have waited. It's, it's closed, but it didn't uh, close below, you know, this mm-hmm. moving average. But uh, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> sorry for that. And basically, I closed all my shares on this day, mm-hmm. right? 
So I caught, I caught this move. Uh, yeah, this AI right here, you know, so this thing didn't do uh, anything uh, on April. So I was waiting for it because, you know, when you were thinking of the AI theme, you were thinking on uh, of AI, of SMCI, and I was waiting for this thing. And, uh, it, you know, it found support on this 200 moving coverage and then it went up and uh, it found support, you know, staying within the range on the 20. And I bought the stock, which is a kind of a breakout, kind of a, you know, a, mm -hmm. a breakaway gap. So I went long on the stock and it worked really, really good on May. So I held all, all this move. I took a, par a big partial a chunk out of it uh, right here. And then basically, uh, I think I sold this going into June, right? Some, some, somewhere around here, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was able to cut some great things on 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 on, um, on May, and I also took this uh, Opera trade uh, right here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, a big uh, name that is showing, you know, relative strength, moving up. The, you have seen the volume footprints, and it's putting a tight range. And I went long on this. Uh, on this thing and i also you know took this uh smci i think ah yeah the smci was one of my biggest trades so yeah, yeah. um uh, yeah so i went long on this smci right here right which is was the catalyst day right here so this was one of the best stocks uh, for the year yeah it was sure. showing extreme relative strength prior to the market you know shaping up and being favorable and uh you know the numbers looked great. The the way the, they they announced a the great guidance and it had great estimates for the next year. So I mean everything was co aligning, right? And I went long on this day right here uh, with a pretty big position, and uh, uh, I added on this day right here. Mm -hmm. So I took some partial some shares off because if you see the ADR of the stock was five point three. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, this thing moved on a single day. I'm sure above 15%. So yeah, I took some shares off on the first day and then I added on this day and again, it was a free roll ad, right? And I had my stop, you know, around this point right here for the rest. Mm -hmm. So for all the shares. <clears throat> and I just held through it uh, and it was um, uh, one of the most amazing uh, trades I, take, I took. But again, on May, I made many mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, I went, you know, early on with... Um, so I, I was using that uh, profit I was making from some of the best trades like SMCI and I was fueling into some other trades with really big risk and I was losing the trade. So mm. uh, instead of having a 25% month up or a 30% month up, I had a 2% roll down overall. Mm. So I, yeah, I made many mistakes on May uh, and it was, you know, a, a great period to, to make money. Um, but then... I really, you know, uh, did really well on June and July. Um, so getting into June and July, that was the first period uh, that, you know, the market uh, early May and getting into July was the first period that I said, you know, maybe we're, the market is getting strong, right? right. Uh, because at, at, even at May, I think that uh, I really thought that maybe, you know, we get, you know, a move uh, right here and then we get the... A fake move and then we get back down so uh, may was a uh, entirely june kind of uh, t told me that uh, or i was getting the feeling that you know we're getting into favorable market periods so that's when i increase, increased my risk more so i increased my risk on may by having short-term goals but based on my rules i increased my risk on june and july and uh, yeah so uh, i'll just be more quick here so i took you know, uh, this aped trade right mm -hmm. here, which is, you know, the same concept you get, you know, this thing uh, has has made prior big moves and, you know, it has put a leg up and then it's getting tight. Uh, so I went long on this day right here. Mm -hmm. I took a parcel after some days and then I did another day on this name. I actually took some uh, shares off on this day. So I was left with minimal position. So I held this thing uh you know, through July as well. And um, I also took, you know, this EH trade, mm -hmm. uh, which worked really good uh, again. And, um, you know, I also took IO and Q, which was one of my best trades. So let's, you know, uh, talk about this more. Yeah, this was a uh, powerful one. 
Yeah, so you know, IONQ, SMCI, um, you know, AI, uh, Carvana that we're going to talk about in, in July, these were well, uh, really, really profitable trades for me. I was able to make so much, you know, risk to, uh, um, you know, ours uh, within a small time uh, time period that, yeah, they were amazing. So I missed this on uh, May, right? I, I would have bought this on May because, you know, it really held up even on this, you know, pullback. It, it held up really good. So I would maybe give it a try on May. So I missed it. So I was waiting for it really patiently because it was one of the momentum leaders on the AI theme. And uh, I really waited patiently. So maybe I, I have given it a try here. I don't remember. But I was able to cut this thing right here. Mm -hmm. So maybe a best entry would have been maybe here. But I really waited. You know, this is a kind of a cheat, you know. And this yeah. is, you know, more of official because it's out of the range. So I, maybe I chased, I chased, this, chased this thing. But I think I did well because it, it worked. It worked out really great. So I took a partial, you know, after a few days. And then on this thing, I really wanted to to res uh, respect my rules. So the next, par the next partial was right here when it closed below the 10 uh, moving coverage. And then I really held to it. And I was able to catch a really big move. And I went out. Uh, of course, I took a partial right here because uh, it started fulfilling some of my, not exactly, but, you know, as I told you, some parabolic. So. Mm -hmm. criteria but then i went full size out uh, uh, here so this is a big move right this is if, if you are in, uh, with size on these things these are big moves yeah and uh, yeah io and q was a great trade i had this hot trade also so uh, if you remember this is where um all the bitcoin halving uh, talk started yep. and uh, when you're thinking of bitcoin halving i mean it's one plus one uh, equals two, right? So if this thing halves, which is a rumor, or if this happens, maybe, you know, the price will increase. So, yeah, this is where uh, I was starting, you know, focusing a lot on on on, uh, this theme. on some crypto. Yeah, some mm -hmm. crypto-related names, and I was uh, making some uh, specific watch list for this name, name. So I was able to catch, you know, this, this hat right here. So I wasn't able to cut this here because I was scared of this big range. So I went, I waited it for to, to get out of the range and then, you know, go in on this, you know, really quick, you know, range here. So it broke out of the range and I went long here. Uh, and this thing hasn't done anything for so long, but it has done big moves in the past, right? When the right. Bitcoin hype was, uh, was on. So I said, you know, maybe this thing does a great move. And indeed, it, it, it made a great move, right? So this trade alone was responsible for, you know, a lot of my gains. And of course, I took a parcel. I, I, it's the same rules. I don't have to repeat them, right? Yeah. I take a parcel of strength and then I trail the weakness. So this thing was going up and up and up and up and up every day. And eventually it went up 100%. And I took another trade on uh, Mara, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same concept. Uh, Crypto related theme, halving, this thing, you know, has assets in Bitcoin. So maybe, you know, uh, they're going to see an increase of worth in their, their assets. And it was holding pretty well, right? From January till June, this thing held it really well. And mm -hmm. of course, it has made prior big moves. So again, I went long on this seat, this thing, and uh, I basically followed the same rules. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, also took, you know, some other trades like UCAR, which, you know, worked for one or two days. And I tracked this SYM trade, which didn't have so much follow through. And I tried, you know, this uh, SMCI that I got and stopped and I didn't, uh, I got stopped again when I was retrying and I wasn't able to get back in. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's what uh, happened in June. And I had some profit cash on from this IO trade that I had or this, you know, uh, APLD trade that I had prior. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'm looking at different, you know. No, all time. good. Yeah. So I had, you know, some profit cash on from, from these trades, uh, you know, and IO and uh, um, what other? Yeah. So IO, SMCI and APLD. Uh, yeah. And then on July, uh, I went long on, you know, CDLX. 
Um, so basically, you know, this thing was beaten down for long, and again, it started showing up on my uh, scans. So I went long on this specific day right here. So this was, you know, um, just a momentum name that was, you know, you just had a, uh, had good numbers. I like the numbers and, you know, it just, you know, had a great leg up and uh, it was getting tight. And, you know, this trade worked really well mm -hmm. uh, right away. And uh, also I took, you know, this uh, GRE setup, GRE. Uh, yeah, and this is this I found from that my dense volume scan as well. So you see, uh, it's a variation of a breakout. So you you yeah. see that volume is pumping, and this stock, you know, really looks more angry than it looked in the past, and it's putting a, a small range. Uh, and this thing, I think, it was uh, maybe uh, no, it was yes, it was crypto related. Uh, so I bought this thing. As you see, I, I write dense volume uh, prior big moves and beaten down on this are my notes from uh, uh, that I had back then. So this thing w worked amazingly. I mean, it went up like 200% in a small period of time, right? And uh, yeah, but um, I also took other trades like Nicola, uh, which is again the same concept, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it worked really well. And I uh, also took, you know, Palantir, uh yeah so palantir i remember being so pissed on may that's that's what that, that's why i got pissed on May because i was losing many trades even though i was doing some i had many 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 mistakes that i wouldn't have normally done and after missing this you know palantir or uh you know i was i was getting crazy i mean i was talking this thing for so long i mean i even went long on uh back on february on this thing right. and missing it on may and doing what it did uh, really pissed me off, right? Mm -hmm. So I was able to kind of catch it on uh, July, but I didn't have much follow through because uh, I closed the trade here. So my best trade, maybe uh, not for the year, but one of the trades that uh, was responsible for my most games and I really traded it many times was uh, Carvana, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I took a trade on this on January, but uh, I remember trying, try, trying this on um it was you know uh, may as well and it, it stopped me out mm -hmm. you know do, do you see this uh yeah 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 it, it really went below and stopped me out so that's that's the sacrifice you make when you're trading with tight stops so if i i wasn't using tight stops look what what could have probably happened right yeah yeah so that's the sacrifice of using tight stops but i was able um to get it right here right so i went uh, with maybe 20 or 25 percent of my my account on this trade uh, because i really liked it i mean it was a, a leader it was a momentum leader if you want to find you know textbook setups this is a textbook setup and i think uh, this thing was highly sorted as well so i said you know if you study the past you're gonna see that the, the stocks that push up to 500 percent are usually also high highly sorted stocks so i really said that I was uh, kind of, you know, um, imagining this thing that this thing could go to eighty or a hundred dollars. So I went uh, really uh, big on this uh, Carvana, mm -hmm. and uh, what happened is, I took of course some uh, a parcel, some shares, one fourth or one fifth, it depends, right, on this uh, kind of days on the move up. Mm -hmm. So what happened is because I was, you know let my imagination drive me and <laughs> I was thinking this thing could go to a hundred dollars I basically tried I, I really like this range here right yeah nice so it's tight. not the, it's not necessarily bad the way I was here thinking because it don't if you don't imagine your trades going up you're you're, ne you're never gonna open a trade but what I did is I I went long on this day right here so mm -hmm. I added a lot of shares and I had like 35 percent of, of my account or even more close to 40 on this on this name right here, right? It was a free roll ad, so my average was around here, mm -hmm. right? But but uh, uh, if if the conditions were normal, this wouldn't affect me. But yeah. what happened is when the market closed, they announced that they're going to announce the earnings the next day when they, they should have announced them uh, two weeks 
you know, uh, after you know, two weeks uh, in the future. So imagine I was close with, you know, close to a 40% position on a name that is, you know, a meme stock uh, that it could do- go down 40% <laughs> on earnings announcement. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first time that I, I got really, you know, scared. Uh, and, you know, these emotional swings from imagining this thing to go to to go 200% up and then out of a sudden uh, you have, you know, a chance that this that you maybe you're going to lose 10% of your account uh, just the next day after waking up. Uh, this this causes a lot of emotional swings, right? So every sure. every uh, you know here you, there's gonna be a name that is gonna write your name, and it's gonna push you to your limits. Yeah. So that's what happened uh, with Carvana, and I, I just thought that I thought that you know this thing is going up. Why would they want to to announce the earnings quick? I mean, I, I was just trying to be rational. I said it's only for the good, right? But you don't necessarily know what. How the market is gonna react uh, to this announcement? Yeah. So yeah, I just stuck to my guns and I, I hold the stock and thank God I did because this thing went, uh, you know, opened up fifty percent up the next day. So that was a really quick, you know, increase uh, of my account in a single day. So sometimes these things that you're gonna get every year, some some of them are gonna reward you, some of them are gonna burn you. Uh, so the kind of you know vanish one uh, the one vanishes the out, uh, but I didn't have you know and uh, at least this year something that opened up uh, really uh, you know opened up with a gap down. So uh, thank God I had this CVNA and I was able to catch a really really great move. But because I was thinking this thing th- because really this thing could really go from here and go to a hundred in, in two days, I've seen that in the past. Yep. So I didn't sell a lot of stocks on that day that I should have. So I sold a lot because I already had a big position. So much, yeah. yeah, but but I hold some shares because I, I really thought this thing could, could continue and it didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I closed some shares on this day and I closed, you know, the rest on this day. But again, I was able to make a lot uh, in a really short period. Um, yeah, so that was about uh, Carvana. And then, you know, the market started reversing uh, late on July and we got back to August. And uh, thankfully, here in Greece, we have a great summer. <laughs> so, yeah. Enjoy so the outside, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I was still watching everything every single day, but I decreased my positions and uh, my position size and my risk. And I was just, you know, trying to, to test the waters because I was getting stopped out of other positions that I have had uh, and, um, you know, I went uh, almost back in cash uh, due to uh, around August and going into September. Um, but uh, I was able to, to know, to get some uh, good trades going like this. Uh, this Yeah, this is this is the VFS, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, I went short on this stock uh, on this day right here, mm-hmm. which is again a parabolic move on a on a fresh IPO, and uh, I was able to take this TLRY um, trade on this specific day right here. So uh, what happened is around August, they announced uh, that they're going to be, you know, uh, more loose on some, uh, you know, restrictions rela- uh, related to the uh, cannabis stock uh, names. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I missed, you know, this move right here, but I was talking, I created a, a focus list with cannabis names and I was watching them. So on August, even though not many things were working, I was able to catch, you know, this TLRY um, right here. But again, I had a lot of stop outs like, as well, like Upwork, I tried it and then I got stopped out. And, uh, you know, this um, SN trade, uh, I tried it on August and then I got stopped out, right? Um, yeah, and PDT, I also tried it and then it didn't have much follow through and I got stopped out. But yeah, I tried to. I, I took AAOI uh, on this day right here, which was a good trade, right? Mm-hmm. I took VFS, as I told you. I took you know this TLR Y. But again, my positions were really small because mm-hmm. I, I I wasn't you know um, I was Overall doing also vacation, yeah, and uh, I really didn't want to harm my, uh, my my account. So I was able I was able to 
cut some good trades, but with minimal position. Mm. Uh, yeah, so September, basically, I took, you know, this uh, ESTC trade, um, which is, again, an, a, a, you know, an episodic pivot, uh, but it didn't have much follow through. So I took a parcel after a couple of days, but then it stopped me out after a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was able to cut, you know, this METC, which is a call-related uh, name. So, again, it's the same structure, right? It's, it gets out of the uh, long range when it's beaten down. It push, it starts to showing some momentum. It puts a range, and then I went long on this range, right? Uh, on this day right here, after this range. Uh, so, it stopped me out, unfortunately, this day right here. Uh, so, I'm talking about September and October as well, uh, together, right? So... Uh, I was able to cut this AMC, which is an intraday trade. So it's the kind of the reverse setup of a, a breakout. So you get a, a big move down and then you, you get, you know, a, a sideways action in the 10 day. And yeah. I was able to, to kind of get uh, some really good trade out of this day uh, alone right here. Uh, yeah. So I took this uh, AMC and also... Uh, I was able to get this uh, Ethereum trade. Yeah, I was able to get this Ethereum trade going into October. Uh, so I didn't, I think I tried it on this day and I got stopped. And then I kind of chased it on this day, but I really liked that it held, uh, you know, it was almost above the range and it really held. Yeah. So I, I went and I went long on this stock right here, but I wasn't again with big size. Mm-hmm. So even though this trade worked beautifully, it wasn't something, you know, big for my account. And, you know, I took some shares off. I got scared on this day. So I sold, you know, uh, some. so I didn't respect my selling rules and I sold a lot of shares. So, yeah, overall, I had a small position. And so even though I, ca- I caught a really big trade uh, from what happened in November and December, yeah, it wasn't, you know, that much. Um, yeah. So let's get to November and December so we can sum it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, this has been great though. Yeah. So on November, uh, I was able to cut, you know, this um, this path trade. Let's, uh, yeah. So right here. So mm-hmm. on November, I was able to, you know, to cut some this path trade on this day right here. And I had my stop at the low of day. Uh, you know, the stock hasn't done anything and it was gapping up above, you know, a range of many, many months. Yep. I like the numbers, so I went long on this, but it didn't have any continuation. And, um, you know, I also tried this ESTC, right? Again, the same concept. Um, really good numbers. Uh, you know, it hasn't done anything great uh, the past few uh, months or years. And, you know, it was gapping up. So I went long on this thing, but uh, again, it, it didn't have any much follow through. And uh, yeah, so basically some of the trades that were really good from uh, November and December were this SLNO trade, which is about technology uh, stock, right? So it's, even though you see this gap right here, imagine that this is, you know, a move because the stock move on pre-market, right? So this is a leg up and then it's followed by, uh, you know, by tightness and then i went long on this day right here and again i followed the same selling rules like i mm-hmm. went out of this on this uh, completely out on this and these days right here uh, another great trade that i had on november was uh, sprc so and i think i also tweeted about that so remember as i told you with biotechnologies you get you know a catalyst and maybe they work on the second day right. so this 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 thing gapped up above the range and this, I also find, found out about it with my dense volume scan. Mm-hmm. So this thing gapped above the range and it really held good. So because it was about technology, I tried on the second day, uh, you know, of the gap. So it uh, even on a, uh, you know, intraday, this thing went, you know, 75% up and I had a, a really good size because I really liked this formation, yep. but it stopped me out on the next days. Um, some other trades that I had was ARM, you know. Yep. This was a fresh IPO. It hit a bottom right here. It started getting tighter. Uh, you know, it, we had an inside day right here, which you can't get more tight. And then it went out of this range right here. So I went long on this 
uh, but I, I saw this thing right here, um, right? And I, I didn't go back in because I missed it. Um, so ARM was a great trade and also ACRM. Yeah, this was a big trade. Um, you see, this is this this is just a normal setup, right? You, you yep. see a move up, you see a kind of a tightness. And, uh, you know, it had an earnings report right here. So it had, you know, some sold some volume. So this was getting really tight and I just went long on this day. So it's not, you know, something clever out of this trade. But, uh, you know, some of not the clever, not sophisticated trades work great. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So this trade worked great. And, uh, um, yeah, I had other trades that, you know, basically I missed this VTSI trade right here on November and then I tried to go long on this day right here and I got stopped out here and this trade worked, worked great up until, up until now but I got stopped out and uh, you know SYM I went long on this day but it didn't have much follow through it stopped me out and uh, you know I remember this shot and I I got so mad about this shot you know I got I, I went long on this thing on October mm -hmm. right here and I just sold it because it didn't, you know, uh, it was Close below screen. my entry. Yeah. And I don't, I don't usually hold stocks uh, negative positions overnight. So I could have bought this stock uh, this day right here and this day right here, and for some reason I didn't. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, yeah, this this was just an amazing move. Uh, crazy. Yeah, this this was just crazy, like four hundred percent move. And I really needed that on November, right? Because you know, if you do well on the the first month, then you lo you you let compounding do its work. So, when you find good trades on the past, you know, the last months, if you let's say you doubled your accounts, which I have done, uh, you know, a ten percent move of your account is like you have a thirty percent move of your initial capital, right? Yeah. So yeah, missing this shot uh, uh, was not that good <laughs> for me, and uh, yeah, also a a. Oh, I, uh, you know, I missed that stock as well mm -hmm. on this day right here. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to go long on this day and I got stopped down on this day and I missed a great move. But overall, because I had increased my risk and I, I managed to take some good positions on, on November, I might, uh, I was able to do well. And on December, just to close it, you know, I had this SS SSNNT trade, which worked great, right? And again, applied the same selling rules. Mm -hmm. You get a three ADR move, you sell some. You get, uh, you know, uh, many, many R multiples. You may take some shares off as well. And then you trail the 10 moving average and then 20. So I close some shares here and here. Basically, these were some, this was fulfilling my parabolic setup criteria. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't sell or went short on this day right here. Mm -hmm. I, I held that stock because it was the, the last month, and I really wanted, you know, to, to let things uh, play out as well, both for my, you know, personal growth and uh, both for the competition. And um, yeah, VIRC, um, yeah, this was a really good, a great trade. So this is this was textbook, you know, you, mm -hmm. you get, this was pure momentum. Uh, it was and linear, you know, this is it can't get more linear than this. So it went up, it was getting tight, then it went above this range on a single day. So I went long on this thing and it just worked out beautifully, right? This thing moved 66% uh, up. And uh, I also had a great trade on alt and I closed it, you know, uh, recently. Mm -hmm. So again, a perfect trade. Like, uh, you know, so sometimes I'm uh, on the fast moving names. I might wait for the first touch on the 10 moving covers and then, you know, a small bounce. And then I may take, you know, the next day. Uh, and this happened on, but only on the fast moving names. Yeah. So on this alt, I tried this day uh, right here, right? Uh, but basically, uh, this day scared me, and I sold. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but I was stalling this thing, and I went finally went long on this day right here, and it worked out beautifully. I mean, this this thing worked out beautifully, and I, I had to close it, uh, you know, officially uh, the couple of last two days because you know it it, it closed below the uh, twenty moving average. But that was a great trade for me, and also GCT. Mm -hmm. I also, you know, uh, hold the stock still, so I was able to go long on this thing on December, right? So this thing has made many mo uh, big moves in the past, and uh, it won't 
out of this range and it was you know uh, the, the volumes started showing really well right so it put up a really really small range right here with inside day so i went long on this day right here and i basically did the same things uh with my selling rules and i basically you know sold most of my shares here and i still keep a portion still so yeah that that was about it and also I took a trade on uh, on CHSN short on you know that day so yep. December was great and uh, I, of course I made many many more trades <laughs> that's the minimum I could get and I already you know talked a lot about them and uh, yeah so basically there are 10 trades that resulted or 15 trades that resulted for most of my my gains this this year I mean this alt trade that I showed you this you know yep. GCT trade this a lunar that happened back on February, mm -hmm. right? And uh, this PKST that I, I went short and uh, VFS that I went short on August and, uh, you know, Mara um, uh, right uh, right uh, here that I went uh, long and uh, GRE uh, that I went long right here, right? And Carvana and IOMQ and SMCI. I mean, that that's about it. That, right. That's where the... the the stocks that made the most amount of money for me. And something that I want to say, you know, after going through all the trades and answer your questions, Richard, is, you know, I missed I missed this move on cryptocurrencies. I mean, I couldn't get this move right here, mm -hmm. right? Check this this coin. It went up, you know, 120% up. Check on this Mara. You know, it went, it, it, it went up a lot. So I wasn't able to catch this move on December and I was frustrated, but it doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. You're not going to catch every single day trade. You're not going to catch every single theme. theme. Th this, some themes are, uh, you know, really fast. And if you don't just find one day uh, to, to basically enter, you're never going to enter on this stock, right? So it didn't matter. I still managed to make 290% for the year. I made a ton of mistakes. I lost many opportunities. I got frustrated a lot. I even got... You know, I deteriorated from from my core on May, on core setups and rules on May. Not so much, but but I did. But mm -hmm. I still managed to put a good year. So I really think this is the normal. This is not the exception. Focus on asymmetric returns and uh, you know have small risks so you can don't have so you uh, you don't won't have these big psychological swings, emotional swings. And I think it's 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 doable. Yeah, and those that those are kind of the keys. Um, I had a question, you know, what do you think are the keys to ha achieving triple digit returns? But I think you pretty much just laid it out there. I think the asymmetric yeah. risk reward, that's, that's the big thing. So you build in a lot of failure into your process that also helps your, your mental, the mental side of trading, as you mentioned before. And, um, and then, yeah, the. Uh, this has been great going through all these different trades. I think it, it really helps show the, the different setups that you focus on and also just your very consistent um, you know, process for managing things with that first partial and then trailing the rest. Um, no, th this has been fantastic. Um, I, I think people might be curious about how you're currently playing NVIDIA and SMCI just because a lot of people are, 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 touched, are, are focused on those right now. W would you mind going through your SMCI trade uh, at the moment? Because uh, we did have that really nice move just, just this past yeah, Friday. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah, uh, uh, you know, th that that means, you know, being adaptive. adaptive. Remember yeah. that I told you, I, I was saying, why I didn't go long on NVIDIA or on Meta? And, you know, finally I did, <laughs> right? So I went long on this thing right here because i didn't want to miss this move mm -hmm. i ha have missed it in the past so i didn't want to miss it again so i went long on this nvidia so i'm i'm, I'm just gonna follow my my selling rules as well so i've sold you know a bunch of shares and then i'm just waiting for the trailing you know moving averages to catch up so if this thing goes parabolic which is more is rare to happen right yeah, With NVIDIA, yeah. Some, yeah. yeah. i mean the world's gonna explode so yeah uh, uh, i'm gonna sell some extra but Generally, I will wait for the 10 and 20 moving covers to catch up, and maybe I will add on this thing. And right. for SMCI, opinions don't matter. So I was really negative on SMCI uh, on the past, you know, couple of two months, two or three months, uh, because I really thought this thing was in a late stage three, uh, yeah. you know, move of a cycle. Because usually, if you study the past, you're going to see that the best leaders. Uh, usually have a phase two of around one and a half year or so 
and usually they go through different phases like you get you know this first phase in phase two and then this and this is the parabolic phase right in a in, in a leader yeah so yeah you, you kind of count the bases so yeah i had that a really neg- negative opinion about the smci but opinions do not matter you just want to follow the clues and the price action so i i, I bought it i bought it yesterday yeah and can right? you show that can you show your intraday buy point for this one yeah yeah of course so it was an opening rage breakout mm-hmm so this is, you know, the one minute chart. And mm-hmm. as you can see right here, straight away, it just, you know. It just went. Put me in, yeah. So I put my stop at the low. Then it never went back there. So uh, it's like seven or eight hours uh, from my entry, right? I took I took some shares off. But, you know, the futures might be bright. So even if I'm correct, and this is, you know, a late stage three or a late stage two. Well, sorry, a late stage two going into stage three, maybe we're going to get a parabolic move, right? Right. Because this is what usually happens in late uh, phase two. Uh, So hopefully I did well and this thing can continue and maybe go exponentially up. And uh, yeah, it will be much self-rewarding because, uh, you know, I didn't trust my opinion. I I just went uh, through the price action and what was happening in the market. Excellent, Noah. It, it was really great to see, you know, such a thorough walkthrough of your trades from this year. I, I think it helps everybody kind of bring everything together, what, what you're talking about, the concepts and actually how you apply it in real life. And, you know, somehow sometimes things don't go according to plan and, and you don't trade quite what your rules say, but you adapt and, and move on. So um, how I always like to end things off is, uh, do, you, do you have any kind of advice for traders watching this? How to improve? How to master setup? What, what, however you'd like to, uh, you know, frame it. What advice do you have for new traders out there? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I've been where you are, guys, and uh, it's it's kind. We kind of all go through the same uh, kind of mystical experience uh, in order to to gain mastery in this field. So, where I'm, um, many of you guys are gonna be, and where you're gonna be, many other guys that are gonna follow are gonna be where you are. So. Yeah, we're all, we're all going to go through the same struggles. So what I would say is, you know, try to find some people that you can learn from. And uh, mm-hmm. as I told you first in my interview, the first people that are going to show up in your feed are, are not, uh, you know, the, the, the best professionals out there. So try to find people that have proven themselves or they had many years in the market or they have achieved something, uh, right? And try to learn what these people are doing. I mean, you need to have that work ethic to to go back in time and study their trades or whatever knowledge they have put out there, either in the form of course or, you know, a newsletter or, you know, just their Twitter account. So you really, really need to have that, uh, you know, you to wake up that the researcher in you and you really need to find the passion on your trading through studying, um, you know. So, yeah, I think studying uh, people that have achieved uh, have achieved great things is really useful. And uh, the second thing is to to be circled with positive people. Yeah. Right. So there's many people. With, with, there's many negativity. I mean, block the news. There's so much negativity out there. And uh, you know, if you are exposed to negative, there are many people with really strong opinions. And uh, you know, if you're exposed to negativity for so long, it's like radiation. It's gonna get to you at some point so you really trading is hard by itself right so you're gonna feel uh, you're gonna be hit right uh, like a tr- from a train from the market you're, you're gonna feel lost you're gonna feel helpless you don't don't need any other distraction so find some positive people the third thing is you know do not rush um, to build mastery mm-hmm. i mean it takes time and it takes dedicated effort and if you sprint, you might lose the forest for the trees. So um, you have to preserve, and many people have said that, but but you have to preserve both your mental and your money capital. If you lose something, uh, one out of those in, in your way, you might quit. And this is the reality. So don't rush to, to, to build mastery because I would say that the best period that you, you can start being more aggressive is when you're starting out, your equity curve you know, looks like this, and after that, a specific point you don't learn something new each and every day so if you are still finding yourself learning something significant uh, significant each and every day 
uh, there's no reason to to, to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. Just wait uh, for a period that you know the 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 equity. Sorry, the 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 wisdom and or you know the your knowledge uh, curve would be uh, sort of linear and uh, you know more smooth, and then you can start being more aggressive because up at this point, you, likely you would have found about setups and you have studied the past and yeah. So really, do not rush to build master. It's it's really crucial. And you know, once you get it, you're never going back. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it takes you uh, a year or two years or five years. Once you get it, you're never gonna go back. And you know, don't and also do not feel stressed stressed by watching people making big, big returns. Okay, I make I made two hundred and ninety percent this year, but you know, two years from now, I might decide that I'm gonna I wanna enjoy life more or I wanna. Um, you know, trade less and I'm, I might be okay with the 30 or 40 or 50 or 60% up. Uh, if I do that for a decade and a half, my grandchildren will thank me. So don't don't focus on these big returns. Try to focus to, to improve every week, do the things um, that work the best. Try to, to, to focus on setups and, and study the past. Um, and, uh, you know, to do a 50% return for a decade, your grandchildren will thank you. That's the reality. And Last but not least, do not forget about living. I mean, sometimes a walk, you know, near the sea with with the friends and uh, or, or a walk in nature or you know a night out, a silly night out with jokes, is is more rewarding and uh, mentally than staying at your house and watching charts every single day and all day. And I had to learn this the bad the bad way. Yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, so I think that that would be my advice uh, for new people. Yeah. I mean, what are we doing this all for? Right. Freedom and, and the chance to 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 do things we enjoy. So, exactly. uh, yeah, Mar Marius, congratulations again on your performance. It's been a real pleasure to have you on here. Um, I'll have your Twitter linked down below in the description that people can definitely check out. Uh, is there is that the best place for people to reach out to you if, if they want to learn more about your system or, or just get in contact? Yeah, yeah, Twitter is fine. Uh, I'm planning to open up a website so I can have my articles up there. Uh, but, you know, Twitter is fine uh, for now. So I don't have any other, you know, social uh, media. Yeah, perfect. Um, again, thank you very much for for, for the time. And, and um, yeah, I think it, it was awesome to see all those different trades um, and also just to see your overall approach. I think that's that's my favorite thing about these interviews is to see different people's processes, their weekly routines, their daily routines, um, because that process is what leads to the results over time. Um, I definitely echo what you said about don't be in a rush to, you know, have crazy performance, uh, because once you do get this, whether it takes you five years, 10 years, whatever it is, whenever that is in your life too, if that's in your twenties or thirties, forties or fifties, whatever, after you've gotten to that level, then you can benefit for decades. So th there's, there's so much time. So uh, Marius, thank you again uh, for, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. The pleasure was mine, Richard. So thank you. Thank you so much for considering me for your podcast. And I hope people can benefit from uh, this conversation that we had. Yeah, I, I think they, I think for sure they did. And uh, if you did, make sure to leave a like down below. Uh, if you have any comments, thoughts, questions for Marius, leave them down below uh, in the comment section. Definitely check out his Twitter, which will link, be linked down below as well. And uh, we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care.